This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. As we've said in previous shows, not everyone using the dark web is doing something criminal. In some ways, this corner of the internet gets a bad name, and research has shown many of the darkest things supposedly happening in the dark web have been exaggerated. That said, it's well known that many people, mainly the younger generation, go there to buy illegal substances that they may have otherwise procured on the street. It's also well known that people with strange inclinations visit this place to chat with others that share their fascination with what we might call the more essential aspects of life. If you've seen our shows on the dark web, you'll know that finding it is not that hard at all. The question is, should you go there? That's what we'll discuss in this episode of the Infographic Show, why you should avoid the dark web. Let's just give you a quick recap on the dark web as you may not have seen all our other shows on this place. It's said that only around 10% of the internet is the internet as we know it meaning the part we can all access. Much of the rest of the internet we call the deep web, which is just the part of the World Wide Web that's not indexed by search engines such as Google. It's a common mistake to think the dark web and the deep web are the same. The dark web is just a small part of the deep web. Many people give it the example of an iceberg. The bit at the top that we can see is the internet as we know it. The main part that lies under the water is the deep web, and the dark web is just a very small part around the very bottom of the iceberg. This is naturally where people go when they don't want to be found. That might be because they have a store there selling the aforementioned illegal substances, or it might just be because they're living in a country that has very oppressive laws on speech. In the dark web, you'll find sites that end with .onion. These websites are not accessible using your regular browser, but you can easily download the Tor browser, and before you can say, where am I, you'll be in the dark web. Here you should have complete anonymity. Ok, so the question is, should you go there? Well, firstly, you should know that the dark web, of course, is of interest to authorities. Illegal things happen there, so we can expect authorities to keep an eye on the place. You should also know that the Tor browser has vulnerabilities. With this in mind, you might ask just how safe is your anonymity. We might also ask if there are other reasons why you should not visit the dark web, reasons more related to you finding things that you probably shouldn't have found. With the latter concern in mind, we looked at Reddit and Quora posts containing people talking about negative experiences on the dark web. We can't vouch for the honesty of these posts, but indeed there are people out there who said they came across things in the dark web they wish they would have never seen. One person on Quora wrote, I browsed dark web for well over half a year before a horrible experience made me quit. That experience sounded very nasty, and it's not something we want to recount here. Let's just say it involved a video of someone being hurt. Now, others say this kind of thing is very unusual, even for the dark web, but we must remember that it does happen, because an Australian man was put in prison for making such videos. Unless you're sick to the bone, this is not the kind of thing one wants to see in life, so we can say that one reason not to go to the dark web might be because out of curiosity, you see something you might not ever be able to forget. Another person who used the dark web said he looked at forums where he found what he called weird stuff. By that he meant people talking about hurting others, discussing gore, and talking about depraved things such as wanting to eat people. And yet another person said he witnessed what he called a very creepy video. He said there were about 50 people watching this video, again relating to someone being hurt. In this case not very hurt, but still not something people would want to see. And many of the folks watching this video were making what he called obscene comments. Another person on the same thread said he was just hitting random links when he came across a cooking section, only the cooking involved humans. This wasn't a video, but a how-to kind of section. I was traumatized for a few days, he said, because he just read the comments. So unless you want to be traumatized, we suggest you might give the dark web a wide berth. We're quite sure you have to go looking for this kind of stuff, however, so perhaps if you have to go there, just be careful what you search for. As one website that gives advice on the dark web tells us, it's easy to click suspicious links or partake in criminal activity. That website says some of these links are deceptive, and before you know it, you're virtually living in the realms of the demented. We looked at another website called darkwebnews.com. It told us that many people access the dark web without using the Tor browser. It said this can be done with websites such as tor to web and onion to web The problem here is that you are exposed, and this puts you at risk of being hacked. Other than that, many people do use the Tor browser, but they don't use a VPN. The problem here is that the Tor has been cracked a few times, and if that happens, your URL can be seen. 
Ok, so you only went to that disgusting site out of sheer curiosity, but still you went there and it might not look good for you when your local newspaper has a headline that goes something along the lines of, boy 17 caught downloading images of XXXX on the dark web. We're also told that you should not enable scripts on .onion sites, which is what many people do. When you do this, we're told, you can leave yourself open to hacking or you just might find a Trojan horse has gotten into your computer. You might also accidentally download files from the dark web, and this is a big no-no. Still, people might just do this by accident. But the big thing to remember, according to that same expert, is don't think that what you're doing on the dark web is illegal. The person says if you're viewing a site on the dark web for any reason from actually desiring to acquire these products or services, or just to wanting to quench your thirst for knowledge on the subject, know that you may be held liable for what you come across. With that in mind, have people been arrested for using the dark web? Well, in 2018, the US media reported that authorities had made a huge bust of people selling illegal things in the dark web. Engadget tells us that these authorities announced the first ever national level undercover bust of dark web outfits selling drugs, weapons, and other contraband. Now, perhaps you'd visited some of those sites that got taken down. Again, it was just out of curiosity, but if they could find the owners of the sites, what's to bet that you could have been exposed? It's just not something you want to happen to you, and it might not matter that you went to those sites innocently. Other websites tell us that the FBI and police from all over the world are regularly inside the dark web. Sometimes they go undercover and manage to find the address where parcels are delivered. The Indian media tells us that arrests were made in 2017 by the Mumbai anti-narcotic cell when some boys had ordered LSD from the dark web. Arrests have also been made of the sellers. In one such case in the UK, a bunch of students at Manchester University were arrested after making a fortune on the dark web selling illegal substances. The Guardian wrote three gang who compared themselves to the Breaking Bad character Walter White included undergraduates studying pharmacology, computer science, petrochemical engineering, geology, and marketing. In another case in 2016, a young British doctor was arrested for buying drugs and sentenced to over four years in prison. The press tells us that in the UK from 2017 to 2018, there were 1,210 drug seizures relating to the dark web, so it might not be as safe as you think scoring your gear there. Police in the UK said buying your stuff on the dark web carries more risk than buying it in the streets. Because if your purchase came from abroad, you could be said to be an importer. The police also added that mail services in the UK are getting very good at spotting packages containing such substances. Ok, so let's say you have no intention of reading or viewing gruesome content or procuring a dozen MDMA pills or some such stimulant. But then we might ask, why are you in the dark web in the first place? Perhaps you have a legitimate reason in that you want to discuss a sensitive issue about yourself, or you're a whistleblower or an at-risk activist. In that case, go ahead and get down with the dark web. But if you don't have those sorts of reasons, one could argue that using the dark web is not worth the risk. Motherboard wrote in 2016 that authorities have developed very sophisticated ways of finding people in the dark web. As we said, sometimes they're undercover. The FBI have been known to sell weapons on the dark web, and who knows where they might be lurking. Motherboard also tells us that the FBI set up one hack, wherein a user clicked on a link that was supposed to take them to an unseemingly illegal image. That person's IP address became known to the FBI. What if you had just clicked on that link by accident? What if your curiosity just got the better of you? As a part of the operation, the FBI harvested over 1,000 US-based IP addresses, and Europol generated 3,229 of its own cases," wrote Motherboard. That article tells us that police units in many countries have now dedicated task forces concentrating on the dark web. So you might ask if you really want to be there. Maybe you went there already and did something illegal. Well, we're told that when police make an arrest of a vendor or someone doing something illegal, they often collect IP addresses of people who had connected with that person or persons. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. If you've seen our shows on the dark web, you'll know some of the things you can find there. We've talked before about illegal activities happening there, but there's much more to this place. You might find whistleblowers in the dark web, perhaps fearful of their identity being uncovered. Human rights journalists might also publish here, with an understanding that their work can't be traced back to them. Critics of oppressive governments might air their concerns there, while others just want absolute privacy when talking to people about their health. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, how to access the dark web. First, let's give you a 101 on the dark web. 
Sources differ on how much of the internet can be seen using a standard browser. In a story, NPR told us that 96% of the internet is not available through normal browsers. Call it the iceberg theory, which means the internet we see is just the tip. Other resources tell us it's more like 90%, which is still huge. So what exactly are we not seeing? First of all, we should understand the difference between the deep web and darknet sites. The deep web might not be quite as degenerate as the dark web. The deep web is simply part of the web that can't be accessed through conventional browsers. One expert tells us despite many representations of a nefarious underground operating out of sight, the deep web is mostly benign private databases and web resources not meant to be accessed by the general public. Lots of data online isn't available to our prying eyes. Companies or banks have private databases or some websites might not want to be indexed. They want to remain unsearchable. It's not really that surprising that most of the information flowing around the internet is protected. But then we have the dark web. And that's a totally different thing. This is a place where one wants absolute anonymity. Not to say people don't get found, they do. As we said, you might find political dissidents working there. In some countries, you could still lose your freedom or life for criticizing a leader or ruler. How does it work? How do people get this anonymity they require? Well, the darknet both incorporates encryption and also uses special privacy browsers. The best known is Tor, which is sometimes called the Onion Router. It's a free software that directs traffic through a massive network consisting of thousands of relays. These servers are run by volunteers. Here's an explanation by the Tor project. Tor's users employ this network by connecting through a series of virtual tunnels rather than making a direct connection thus allowing both organizations and individuals to share information over public networks without compromising their privacy. We're told that the Tor network was created by the US Navy and is still partly funded by the US government. People can publish websites that can't be tracked. Tor tells us that while many people might think chat rooms are just full of rather strange people talking about eating each other or making a poodle burger, many people go to hidden chat rooms to discuss privately how they survived abuse, or perhaps talk about an illness they have that they're afraid could be found out in chat rooms outside of private browsing. This is a good thing, of course, because why shouldn't people at times have a bit of privacy? You might remember probably the most infamous site, the Silk Road, a marketplace where you could buy many things that you won't be seeing sold in the local shopping mall. But some of these items were just regular things. More recently, Alpha Bay and Hansa were also closed, but these sites were run as hidden services or onion services on the Tor network. But this show isn't about what we find on the dark web. It's more of a how-to show to tell you how to access the dark web. It actually isn't hard at all. So first, get yourself a virtual private network or VPN if you're intending to get on the dark web. This is easy. Just Google VPNs. Even our sponsor Dashlane has a VPN. Some are free, some of them cost a small amount of money. You don't need a VPN, but if you want to get extra secure, get one. Even if Tor was compromised and you were visiting the darknet sites because you had a VPN, it's very unlikely you could be traced. Ok, so you have your VPN and you're ready to access the Tor browser. To do this, just go to Tor and download it. Couldn't be easier. Only download from the Tor site. If you Google the words download Tor browser, you should see the top result as the Tor project. Just wait and then install the browser on your machine. Next, you'll have the option to start the Tor browser. This you will do, and you will have access to .onion websites. If you want to visit marketplaces, simply find a darknet market list. You might also go to the popular databases, the Onion directory and the hidden wiki. These will tell you how to access most things in the dark web. Note, some people say it's best to not change the window size while in the Tor, as authorities can track you easier if you do. Others say also turn off JavaScript. Some others say that you should put tape over your webcam, because you just never know. Hey, Mark Zuckerberg does it. Disable your mic too. Basically shut down all apps that are on your computer. It should go without saying that you don't use your real name and try not to send anyone a photo of yourself. You should also use an anonymous email account. When you're done with your session, just shut your computer down. Voila! You've been in the darknet. And you've done it the safest way. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. A certain amount of mystery still surrounds what has become known as the dark web. The very name evokes images of an underworld, a kind of catacomb where scoundrels hide out and human depravity awaits us around every corner. 
but research has shown that the dark web is perhaps not as dark as many of us imagine. Yes, one can certainly go to this place and acquire a handful of illegal substances, and yes, if a person so chooses, they can scour the dark web and find images that most of the world would find repellent. But let's just say you won't find hitmen for hire all over the dark web, nor as much video violence than we might have thought. The question is though, who on earth came up with this idea in the first place? We've been through this in other shows, so we'll make it short, and we're talking about what the dark web actually is. You see, the internet as most of us know it, the bit you're using right now, is only a small part of the web. Sources don't agree on how much, but it's said the part of the web that we can access using ordinary browsers is only about 10% of the entire thing. You can also find sources that say it's 4% or even 1%. Still, it's thought there are about 1.8 billion active websites on the net, although again you can find sources that give a different number, much higher sometimes. This doesn't of course mean that the rest of the web is the dark web and full of dark marketplaces, otherwise we might have cause for concern. What it means is that the rest of the web, which we'll call the deep web, is used by private companies, governments, etc. It's invisible to you. Well, it is if you can't hack into it or are not actively legally using it. Think about your email, online banking, company servers. These aren't exactly searchable on the web, so of course the deep web is way bigger than the navigable web. Ok, so you understand that. What about the dark web? This is a place within the deep web that's also hidden but can be accessed using something called the Tor browser. You can use this browser along with a VPN or a virtual private network to access the dark web. You might do this if you're an activist and want anonymity, such as people that criticize governments whose modus operandi shows no mercy for political dissidents. But you might also enter the dark web so you can access what are sometimes called dark sites. Here's where you might find someone selling serotonin enhancing pills by the bagful or ounces of white powder, where you might find hackers for hire or someone to chat with about your strange predilection for drinking your own blood by the wine glass. As we said, the dark web might not be as demonic as movies or some politicians depict, but you can read stories in the British press about how the young generation now buy their illicit substances there more than in the streets these days, or how some people were arrested by the FBI for distributing images that 99.9% .9 of viewers would find disturbing. Ok, you get the picture, but now you must be thinking, if this stuff goes on, why would anyone in their right mind have created it in the first place? Well, to answer that, we must look to the US military. Let's remember that the internet itself was a byproduct of military technologies, as was much of the technology we take for granted today. It was in the mid-1990s that the US wanted their intelligence operatives to have a place, a virtual place, where they could communicate with total anonymity. They started working on something called TOR, an acronym that stands for the Onion Router. But why give this to the people? Wasn't that just madness? According to the BBC, the military did this because if more people were using it, then it would be harder to spot the activity of operatives among all the other noise. Foreign policy dives even deeper into the history of the dark web, and here we'll summarize. In 1969, a student at the University of California sent a message between computers connected by ARPANET. This was the beginning of the web as we know it, and it was developed by the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. In the next few years, more computers started connecting with each other on secret networks, and these were sometimes called dark nets. This might not sound like much to you, but it was a breakthrough in secret communications. Then we see the internet explode in the ensuing decades. Only part of this internet is a haven for illegal activity. In the 1990s, we saw a lot of illegal file sharing, and we're told this set off a tsunami of darknet activity. The people sharing the files were using data havens that couldn't be shut down by the authorities. So even before the dark web as we know it today, there was still a hidden part of the internet. Then in March 2000, we saw the release of something called Freenet. This is a place you could access with anonymity and get your hands on files, legal or illegal. Freenet is a near-perfect anarchy, the Irish creator proudly told the New York Times. You see, it wasn't about sharing and distributing dodgy content, but some people felt that there should be a place in the internet free from censorship and the prying eyes of the government. What we're trying to say is that long before Tor, people were trying to create room in the internet where people could operate without being surveilled. 
Then in 2002, we got Tor to protect those American operatives, but it only took a few years for sites accessible through Tor to become filled with copyrighted material from Hollywood movies to versions of Microsoft Office. It became a trading ground for illicit material, and people loved it because they could go there with the assurance that they wouldn't get arrested. Imagine buying stolen goods on the street, but having the superpower to become invisible. Things heated up in 2009 when a guy that called himself Satoshi Nakamoto mined the first bit. Bitcoin, a virtual currency that was untraceable. Now you can launder cash, spend your Bitcoin inside the darknet. It was a marriage made in heaven. In 2011, we saw the first modern darknet marketplace in the Silk Road, named after ancient trading routes in Asia. There you could find an array of legal and illegal goods and services, but it only lasted short of two years, and the creator was eventually sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. But as Wired pointed out in 2015, it's not as if everyone using Tor is accessing the dark web. In fact, the number is quite small, and though you can find illegal things there, you can also find them on the regular web. Most people sharing illegal images or videos use the normal web, not the dark web. According to Wired, whose writer researched the dark web for a number of years, yes, you can find depravity there, but it's also full of doctors giving advice they might not give out in the open. It's a place where people can talk and not worry about their careers, where others can talk about a disease they have that they dare not talk about out in the open. And as we said, it's used by a lot of people who need to discuss issues in a country that would likely lock them up for discussing those issues. This includes some people inside the USA who would rather not have their words watched. Former NSA contractor Edward Snowden famously said that the government was working hard to anonymize Tor users, but it wasn't always successful. We always know that the FBI has had some success finding criminal activity there, but these are usually sting operations, not just pinpointing a person after a share or sale. We say this because some of you might be asking why the government hasn't gone to greater lengths to close us all down. There are many reasons, but one is that it's still useful in terms of the greater good. Two is that the governments of the world have shown that when things get murky in the dark web, then authorities will swoop. It's not impenetrable. You might have some anonymity, but you're not a ghost. You're merely wearing a sheet over your head. The US government supports the dark web and funds it because, as we said, it's useful. At the same time, it's not easy to take down a decentralized network. There isn't an off switch. This network is spread across the globe and protected by strong cryptography. It's almost like ether, or a living, breathing entity whose plexus of veins are threaded throughout the world. You might also ask yourself what would happen if somehow Tor wasn't available, if somehow part of the dark web was blacked out. Would the darkness disappear? No, it wouldn't. It would appear somewhere else. The government has shut down darknet sites, and rightly so, but more will just pop up. The government could try and get rid of the Tor browser, but as we said, it has no reason for doing this. China actually has been successful in blocking the Tor browser, but other governments have failed. This is what Motherboard says about blocking the browser. Governments can block access to VPN services by blocking access from IP addresses linked to VPN providers. Blocking Tor is more complex and requires identifying and blocking the destination nodes traffic travels through, rather than the URL or IP address. Most governments that allow more or less free speech agree that of the 2.5 million Tor users, very few of them are doing nefarious things in the dark web. Believe it or not, sellers in the dark web agreed in 2018 to stop selling the powerful and deadly opioid fentanyl. Many operators agreed that it was just too dangerous, and perhaps they also knew that it would no doubt bring unwanted attention to their marketplaces. In conclusion, the dark web, like any street in any town, does contain some rather unethical people, but for the most part, what you see there is just innocent folks protecting their identity. It would be crazy for any government to try and close their entire park just because some guys sell their substances there at night in the back corner. But if things get too bad, you can be assured someone will go after them. Meanwhile, the rest of the people that use this park for late night anonymous chats can do so without harassment. However the dark web started, it's here to stay, which means that you better have some serious protection against anyone who's looking to exploit it for nefarious purposes. What you're looking for can't be found on the internet, or at least the internet you know. Step right this way, into these doors, and welcome to the dark web. What is this mysterious place where anything can happen? You're about to find out. Here are 50 most insane facts about the dark web. Number 50. Does it actually exist? If you're starting your dark web journey by typing in how to find the dark web on Google, 
you're likely to be disappointed. The darkest corners of the internet trade in some pretty illegal stuff, so no one who goes searching for it will find it easily, including law enforcement. So if you're going looking for this hidden network of markets and illegal sites, you should probably know someone who's in the know. Think of it as an old school speakeasy. If you want to get in, you better know the password and have the right equipment. Number 49. How do you get in? None of the sites that make up the dark web can be accessed through a standard browser because Big Brother is watching. Instead, dark web users communicate through small friend-to-friend peer-to-peer networks that let them communicate anonymously as well as anonymous networks like Tor, Freenet, I2P, and Riffle. These censorship-free systems are undetectable by law enforcement, mostly, and most can be installed on a normal computer for little to no money. But the name may not be to everyone's tastes. Number 48. Mmm, onion rings? Wait, what do onions have to do with this? Maybe when you're done satisfying your craving at Burger King, you can protect your cyber security. Anonymous communication is often called onion routing because after your message is sent off, it's coded in layers of encryption, making it impossible to read if anyone hacks it. With each router it goes through, it has one level of encryption peeled away until it arrives at its destination in its original form. Although the original sender remains anonymous as long as they want to be. And the same goes for the funding. Number 47. Got two bits? If you want to buy something on the dark web, you probably won't be paying cash. After all, you won't be meeting anyone in person, and credit cards probably aren't the best idea either as they can be easily traced. So that leaves one common source of payment on the dark web. Cryptocurrency. Tokens made of data, their most popular version being Bitcoin. But don't be surprised if some dark web sites want more rare currency that's even lower on the Fed's radar than the big gun. And while the feds might know that you bought crypto, the encryption makes it very difficult for them to find what you spent it on. And the dark web might be smaller than you think. Number 46. Welcome to the Bazaar The dark web is mysterious, imposing, and hard to get to, but it might be less difficult to get around than you expected. That's because many of them have been taken down by law enforcement. It's estimated that there are only around 55,000 sites using the .onion domain. However, only 8,400 of those are active and most are seemingly benign. As for the sites that actually engage in illegal activity, it seems to be a high percentage, as many as 68%. But no one knows which will be taken down next. In fact, no site on the dark web is ever truly safe. Number 45. Even Goliath's Fall It was the original online black market, the first true dark web market, and Silk Road was powerful. Using Bitcoin as its method of trade, Silk Road was on the run in the Tor router and primarily specialized in selling illegal drugs. It charged people to start accounts and had over 100,000 users at its high. And in 2013, it all came crashing down. The government shut down the site, seized over a billion dollars in Bitcoin, and arrested its founder on charges relating to the massive sale of illegal drugs. But that's not the only thing you can buy on the dark web. Number 44. It's free money. You know how annoying it is when you get a security alert on your credit card and you have to cancel the card? There's a decent chance your card just wound up on the dark web. Stolen credit card numbers are some of the hottest items on the black market auctions, but they're not worth much if they get cancelled. That's why these auctions are usually sold in batches of 100. Some are bound to still work before they get cancelled. Think of it as a collection of scratch-off tickets, if they were wildly illegal. But some information is even more personal. Number 43. Social Insecurity Another prominent item sold on the dark web? Social security numbers. Identity theft is pretty common, but there's one particular item that everyone wants. Any social security number belonging to someone with a credit score above 750. This can be invaluable for getting an expensive loan, and it often takes a lot longer to figure out that a social security number has been stolen than a credit card. Of course, if someone gets caught, the penalties for identity theft are much higher, too. But what if your tastes in stolen goods are a little… safer? Number 42. Hot Entertainment Stolen credit cards are big business on the dark web, but some of them are used before they ever go up for auction. And that's the case for the offer of a lifetime Netflix subscription paid for with stolen credit cards. All the risk falls on the person holding the credit cards and you just sit back and enjoy all the content. Of course, if something goes wrong with the source of the cards, you can't exactly contact customer service. And is the monthly subscription fee really worth the Bitcoin? And this next entry takes extreme couponing to a new level. Number 41. Half off today only. Have you ever been behind that woman in line at the grocery store rummaging through her purse for coupons? She might be a notorious cyber criminal. 
One popular low-level scheme on the dark web is to sell ultra-realistic copied coupons for common grocery items that work for 90 days. Some of these are even made to order, allowing people to get discounts on their favorite foods. That's a lot of work for 50 cents off Frosted Flakes. Number 40. Try your luck. Want to see if you can double your Bitcoin? Just like the grocery store lets you sink your money into low stakes and high stakes lottery, there's a Bitcoin lottery too. It works just the same as the real thing, except for the fact that it can only be purchased in cryptocurrency. Also, if you hit the jackpot, you don't get a giant novelty check to show off, and your cousin who's always broke doesn't see you on the news. That might be a plus. But if you have more illegal plans, the dark web is for you. Number 39. The Nth Degree Looking to get a high-paying, high-level job, but there's just one problem. You flunked out. With some Bitcoin on the dark web, you could easily become a high-ranking Ivy League student. This isn't a new scam. Fake college degrees have been available for years online to be printed out. But they've now moved to a new platform. Getting fake college transcripts for a background check is trickier, but it has been offered. Will this pass the smell test for your would-be employer, or will it just be a conversation piece on the wall? That's not the seller's problem. And if you want to pull off the perfect crime, you might need the perfect gear. Number 38. Mask up. Masks are everywhere right now, but none like these. Bank robbers have been using Halloween masks to disguise their identity for a long time, but those in the know manage to get their hands on ones that provide complete anonymity. These realistic silicone masks are a much closer fit, create a realistic skin tone, and even make it easy for a bank robber to essentially change race and throw the police off the trail if they escape. Many areas have made these masks illegal as a security risk, which means there's only one place to go. You might even be able to get some gear that can't be found anywhere else. Number 37. Lights out. One dark website in China had a unique electronic device available, claiming to be able to add credits to electronic slot machines to allow unlimited play. Jackpot! But the device actually seemed to be a lot more powerful than that. It worked as a portable EMP generator, one that was powerful enough to fry any electronic device within its vicinity. In criminal hands, it could be used to sabotage ATMs and other money-filled devices. In darker hands, it could be used to create a disaster or shut down parts of a city. Let's hope it was taken off the market. But the dark web isn't all that bad. It might even get you a new friend. Number 36. Wild Web As Netflix Tiger King swept the internet, many people wondered, how do I start my own Tiger Zoo? The show probably would have talked them out of that, but the dark web is there for their worst instincts. Illegal wildlife trade has been big on the dark web since at least 2015, with listings for crocodiles, big cats, baby gorillas, and other animals. And if some users prefer their animals less lively, they can also buy illegal animal products including bear paws, African ivory, and even dog meat. But the dark web has a lot of uses besides illegal trade. Number 35. Dark News the dark web has become a haven for people looking to get away from corporate-driven news, believing they have a partisan bias and use too much spin. That led to some dark web users creating a new news aggregate site called Soylent News. It's controlled by the users, filled with news items from around the world, and has a public discussion forum. And hey, if a crackdown is going to start on dark web markets, maybe you'll find out here first. But some surprisingly famous sites have dark web counterparts. Number 34. Bookface Ah, Facebook. Where else are you going to go get called names by an old high school classmate over a political issue you don't care about? So what does a social media network need with a dark web mirror site? Well, for one thing, the site is blocked in many countries around the world, and the mirror site lets millions of people join in. It also allows people to use the site anonymously, and you don't have to worry about the company selling your data to whoever passes by that day. One company even created their own dark web mirror. Number 33. ProPublica Undercover when you make powerful enemies, you need powerful protection. The nonprofit journalism site ProPublica is famous for exposing betrayals of the public trust, even when it involves revealing private documents. Because the government could crack down on them or big business could sue them, they maintain their own dark web mirror site since 2016 to ensure that their archive can't be lost, and those looking for them can always find their latest expose. But how do you get around the dark web? Number 32. A Map Through the Dark you know how you can just tool around Wikipedia and find enough links to keep you occupied while you should be working on your term paper? Well, the hidden wiki is a little different, because the dark web is so hidden, to find any site you'll need to know both what it is and its exact URL. This won't show up on Google, that's why this site exists. If you've made it to the dark web, you can go to this site first and find a map of just about anything you want, including a totally private social media network. 
Number 31. Welcome to the Galaxy Do you want a place to post your private thoughts without any fear of your employer or family seeing them? Have you been cancelled one too many times for your tweets? That's where Galaxy 3 comes in, an entirely dark web-based social media platform. It's mostly used by long-time users and is a great place to find that specialist you're looking for. Kind of like approaching someone in a dark alley, except the dark alley is on your computer. In fact, just about anything you can find on the regular internet you can find on the dark web. Number 30. A Mirror World Many sites have popular dark web knockoffs, created often with the help of designers from the original site. Reddit, DuckDuckGo, and mail servers are just a few of the copies you can find, as users seek an escape from the threat of government censorship or site moderation. Most of these communities are much smaller than the original, but for those select few in the know, they can enjoy a truly anonymous community. So how do you join the dark web? Number 29. Your own little slice of the dark you go on a site like GoDaddy or Google Domains to purchase your website and you find no options for Onion Domains. Well, if it was out there for anyone to buy, it wouldn't be a secret. To get a dark web domain, you'll have to go to the dark web. The most popular choice is Onion Domain, a website that sells them for, you guessed it, Bitcoin. Most URLs sold through there are random collections of digits, but you can have a custom one if you're willing to pay. But for those who enter, there's a darker side than the illegal markets. Number 28. Unlock the Mystery Many visitors to the dark web just want the thrill of something mysterious and possibly illegal. That's why a popular item on the market is mystery boxes. You bid in Bitcoin and the box is anonymously shipped to your house. What's inside? That's anyone's guess. Some people have found harmless items like a My Little Pony backpack or even completely empty boxes. Not worth the cost? Good luck getting a refund. But some unboxers have received a more unpleasant surprise. Number 27. An Unwelcome Gift Unboxing might be the hottest trend on YouTube, but those unboxing their dark web gifts are often surprised in the wrong way. Some have found drugs, some have found weapons that seem to have blood on them, one found a Ziploc bag full of hair, and one found more personal touch. It was a bag full of white powder marked with a biohazard sticker. And a CD. When the CD was played, it was the sound of laughing followed by a mysterious voice saying, I see you. Who sent it? No one ever found out. But who is actually sending these boxes? Number 26. Generation Dark Web Is the dark web full of dangerous criminals? The answer is a lot more complicated than that. While no one knows the exact demographics, many of the most avid users are tech-savvy Gen Z kids who are concerned about their privacy. Many of them have no criminal history, so the odds are many of these terrifying mystery boxes are essentially elaborate pranks designed to scare those who receive them or go viral on YouTube. But that's not always the case. Number 25. A Den of Thieves The dark web has been increasingly used as a haven for high-level criminals looking to get away with their crimes away from the public eye. Because the dark web is an international hub, it's become a common place for Russian financial criminals to commit fraud. A common tactic is to create a duplicate of a legitimate commerce site with a slightly different URL and trick people into giving them their personal or financial information, which then disappears into thin air. But the crimes of the dark web don't always stay there. Number 24. Hack Away One of the most notorious criminal enterprises on the dark web is hacking collectives. These criminals sent out Trojan horse emails and files that contain links to viruses. While some viruses are just destructive and destroy computer systems because some hackers just want to see the world burn, most are designed to extort the user. You want your computer containing all your files unlocked? Better pay up. In Bitcoin, of course. Whether the password to unlock the computer will work, well, that's anyone's guess. But the hackers are getting savvier and savvier. Number 23. A bigger hack? Previously, you could almost avoid most viruses by not opening suspicious files. But hackers have developed new, smarter viruses that can spread through back doors and attack computer systems even if no one lets them in. It's been used to shut down everything from hospital computer networks to government sites to oil pipelines supplying much of the US. And the bigger target, the higher the ransom. And in 2017, the crisis hit its worst point. Number 22. Wanna Cry? On May 12, 2017, the Wanna Cry cyber attack began and spread through over 230,000 computers. Many users paid the ransom quickly, but no one ever got their data back. This led to crises around the world as Microsoft scrambled to get updates out that would protect their computers, and security experts battled to save much of the world's computer infrastructure. The savior? Marcus Hutchins, a cyber expert who had worked on illegal hacking software before and knew the ins and outs of viruses. Sometimes a dark web denizen is needed to stop the dark web. 
but some darker corners of the dark web are lurking as well. Number 21. That's nasty. For those who came of age in the internet age, finding your first porn on the internet has replaced sneaking a peek at dad's lady mags. But for those looking, they probably shouldn't cut their teeth on the dark web's offerings. These hidden sites are where people go when they want a type of porn that's darker than the average. Much contains illegal activity, and both the providers and the downloaders have found themselves in trouble with the law. But for every site the law cracks down on, the odds are another one is waiting. Some areas of the dark web may even be a threat to global security. Number 20. Terror from the Dark Web It was the 1990s and the internet was still new, but that didn't stop dangerous elements from carving out their own corner. The birth of the dark web let people gather away from prying eyes, and some of the first to take advantage were extremist groups from around the world. The dark web became a place for terrorist groups to gather, spread propaganda, and plot attacks without the authorities being able to track them. It wasn't long before the most prominent terror groups in the world got in on the action. Number 19. The War Goes Dark As the Syrian civil war raged, brutal attacks were carried out against the civilian population, and on the dark web some evil elements were trying to pass more money on the terrorists. When a man named Ahmed Sarsour attempted to hire snipers via the dark web, he was quickly caught. Investigations showed that even ISIL had a presence on the dark web, with multiple sites, some real and some fake, serving as places for the terrorists to gather. But they were ultimately undone by an unlikely source. Number 18. Who are they? After the 2015 Paris attacks, ISIL found their dark website taken down and hacked. The culprit, a powerful hacker group named Anonymous, known for their use of a Guy Fox mask as their icon, and for the release of information the most powerful people in the world don't want you to know. A collective of online guerrillas, their tactics were ruthless and targeted elements from across the political spectrum, meaning just about everyone wanted to stop them. But that would be easier said than done, and the hacker collective pulled off some impressive feats. Number 17. Crossovers Anonymous became one of the first dark web groups to maintain a presence on both the main internet and the dark web setting up anonymous Twitter accounts and on other social media sites. This was so their information and ultimatums could be seen by a wider audience, as they took on targets including Scientology, the Ferguson and Cleveland Police Departments, and even the Canadian government. But it wasn't to last. The anonymous Twitter account was quickly suspended. But the powerful hacking group wasn't always on target. Number 16. False Flags Anonymous was a large collective operation, and that meant its information was only as good as each individual member putting it out. The hacking group's reputation took a big hit during the Ferguson protests when they vowed to identify the officer involved in the shooting, and then named the wrong one. Later, they promised to reveal a list of politicians who were secretly members of the KKK, and named several who were members of religions and ethnicities who are hated by the Klan. Whoops. But their most prominent role crossed over into the world of journalism. Number 15. Welcome to WikiLeaks WikiLeaks isn't on the dark web, it's a website anyone can visit, but no one's managed to take it down, no matter how many prominent governments would like to. Founded by the controversial Julian Assange, it specializes in posting classified documents from the highest level of governments around the world. While Assange has been provided his documents by agents within the government, most of his communications are done by the dark web. That hasn't stopped him from being wanted by multiple countries, leading him to take refuge in the embassies of friendly nations. But not all hackers have a higher purpose or political goal. Number 14. The Wrong Evite You wouldn't think Evite would be a hub for dark web activity. The social planning service has tens of millions of followers, most of which use it for organizing invites to events. But in 2019, the site was targeted in a massive security breach, and more than 10 million users had their personal information leaked. The hacker behind it had a relatively modest demand, just under $2,000 in Bitcoin, but Evite had a policy of not paying ransom to avoid encouraging hackers, and countless people's information wound up being put up for auction on the dark web. But not every dark web mystery has a criminal connection. Number 13. Dead End Mystery It was August 2012, and around the dark web, users were finding odd clues. This was part of an augmented reality game which combined clues on the internet that led them to locations in the real world. A combination of codes scattered around multiple sites made it very hard to crack, and users went to intense lengths like driving to New York to answer a specific payphone at 3 in the morning. So what was the mystery behind this scavenger hunt? A Bitcoin treasure? Nope, it was all a promotion for a new album by the hip-hop group Death Grips. Ok, so that was sorta of chaotic neutral, but the dark web has its good side too. Number 12. 
Checkmate! Are you interested in testing your wits but never knowing who you're playing? Feel free to step into a game of chess played exclusively on the dark web. You'll be matched against someone from anywhere in the world and will play on a simple website that looks like it could have come straight out of 1995. While sure, you could just play in real life or on an old regular website, at least here you'll never know that you just got trounced by a six-year-old prodigy. And those cramming for a paper can say, thank you, dark web. Number 11. The Science Side Academic papers are expensive and can quickly add up for struggling college students living on a ramen. That's why many sites have cropped up getting around those paywalls by uploading papers and textbooks to the dark web. While some are illegal piracy websites that get shut down regularly, the trend has spread with some organizations even encouraging authors to submit their own papers for public viewing on Onion domains. And if you're a journalist looking to protect your source, the dark web is there for you. Number 10. Blown Away Being a whistleblower is a risky game. At best, you could be violating a corporate non-disclosure agreement. At worst, you could be risking jail time or even your life. That's where Secure Drop comes in. A dark website that provides open source submission, it lets journalists and sources communicate without storing any IP addresses or other data. Prominent newspapers like the Washington Post have even started using them. The dark web is going mainstream in journalism. But for every ray of light, there's a dark side. Number 9. The Worst of the Worst The dark web has played host to some truly notorious criminals, and some have paid a heavy price. Vietnamese hacker Hu Ming Ngo might be one of the worst for quantity, not quality. The identity theft expert had been running a massive operation from his home and managed to steal over 200 million people's identity information around the world. He would sell it to other hackers until the feds got up with him, which landed him 13 years in federal prison. But that wasn't the harshest sentence any dark web criminal got. Number 8. The Kingpin If you went through the online marketplace Silk Road in the 2000s, the odds are you heard about someone called the Dread Pirate Roberts. That would be the man better known as Ross Ulbricht, the mastermind of Silk Road. His digital black market sold millions of dollars in illegal drugs and other goods, but not weapons, as the staunch libertarian didn't believe in them. But that didn't stop him from contracting out hits on potential enemies. When his empire came crashing down, he was eventually sentenced to a double life sentence plus 40 years. But for some criminal enterprises on the dark web, they claim to go even further. Number 7. Guns for Hire is it really possible to contract someone's death on the dark web? A lot of people think so, because you don't have to go far to find someone claiming to be an assassin for hire. The process is simple. You pay them Bitcoin, they hunt their target, and no one ever knows who hired them. But no assassinations have ever been tied to these dark web assassins, which means many people think the entire thing is a hoax. But if it is a hoax, one assassination platform took the hoax too far. Number 6. Boldface Names it was called the Assassination Market. Founded by a self-declared crypto-anarchist who used Tor to keep the site secret, it offered crowdfunded assassinations of prominent figures including the President of the United States and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Anyone who claimed a bounty could collect however much had been raised for that assassination, but no one ever took the bait on the big names. While the site has been defunct for years, someone cashed out all the bitcoins in 2018. But is the dark web coming after… you? Number 5. The Hunters Rumors abound of people being kidnapped and sold on the dark web, and there's truth to this. In 2019, a British model named Chloe Ayling went to Milan for a photo shoot, only to be kidnapped by two men who ambushed her. She was found after four weeks, and the plan by the men was to put her up for auction on the dark web. No one knows who intended to buy her or what their plan was, but whether people are being sold on the dark web or not, some kidnappers see it as a new revenue stream. But for those sold on the dark web, is there a dark destination? Number 4. What is the Red Room? Wherever you look, people are talking about the darkest of dark web locations. A website where you can watch live streams of random people being tortured and killed by masked maniacs. Who are these victims? Some say they're horrible people who escaped the law, and others say they're innocents kidnapped off the streets. But no one has been able to find any of these red rooms, and authorities believe the most likely reason why is that they're only a gruesome urban legend. But urban legend or not, they're not going away anytime soon. Number 3. A Dark Sensation The Red Room legend might be the dark web's lasting legacy, with the idea becoming popular far from the internet's reaches. Horror movies have been made out of the concept, a digital update of the popular torture cabin genre of horror. Even comics are getting in on the action. Acclaimed cartoonist Ed Pisker releases a monthly indie comic about the employees of the torture chamber called, you guessed it, Red Room. 
but this dark corner of the internet isn't a secret anymore. Number 2. More popular than ever Despite all the scary rumors, the dark web is becoming a popular place to do business. Part of it is the privacy and the decreased risk of hackers, which is ironic because you're more likely to interact with hackers there. Some of it is the increased use of cryptocurrency. But whatever the reason, it's paying off. It's estimated that up to 30% of Americans have used the dark web at some point. And that means big money. Number 1. Cha-ching! No one knows exactly how much money is spent on the dark web each year. It's a big part of the appeal, no one knows what you're up to. But estimates are now that it's a billion dollar business mostly in smaller Bitcoin transactions. That's a lot of secret purchases, and whether they're buying mystery boxes, drugs, illegal pets, or your identity, well that's for them to know and you to not find out. You finally picked up the courage to visit the dark web and you took every necessary precaution to stay invisible to the authorities. At first you were only going to look around and not actually purchase anything, but after a few of your buddies came around to your house, you all decided you'd buy a big bag of illegal pills. Not only that, after a few drinks you watched a video you shouldn't have watched. You weren't concerned, you used a VPN, your IP address couldn't be seen by prying eyes, and then boom, one day the cops burst through your door. How on earth did that happen? How did they find you? That's what we'll discuss today. Number 5. Hacking First of all, you should know that a lot of people use the dark web for good reasons. Maybe they are journalists or political dissidents in countries with strict regimes, so some human rights advocates are happy that the authorities can't find people in the dark web. That's why it was controversial when a cybercriminal named Eric Owen Marquez was arrested in 2013 and later got a prison sentence of 30 years. This guy was certainly in the wrong and was hosting websites within the dark that were selling drugs, hacking techniques, and money laundering operations. He was huge, and it's thought his cloud computing company Freedom Hosting was hosting almost half of the sketchy websites within the dark web. The FBI got him. They found his server in France and subsequently tracked him down to Ireland. This shouldn't have happened, of course. The Tor network this guy used was supposed to be impenetrable. But then, one day, users started seeing something weird. A new code running in websites hosted by Freedom Hosting. Suddenly, all the websites went down. That weird code exploited a Firefox vulnerability and so not only did the websites go down, but people using those websites were unmasked. Well, they were until they could update their software. Tens of thousands of IP addresses were exposed and some of those people that were exposed were arrested. That could have been you and you might have been seen buying bags of Columbia's finest powder. But private email systems were also run on Freedom Hosting, so journalists or Freedom Fighters may have also been exposed. So that's one way you could be found out using the dark web. The government might get its crack team of hackers together and create a code that exploits a vulnerability in some software. It might not mean they've come knocking at your door, but your name will certainly be saved in the FBI's database. You've been flagged. Thousands of people around the world have been arrested this way. In the US, the FBI won't say how it hacks its way into the dark web, while in other countries, governments also keep their surveillance under wraps. In the UK, the government gives its intelligence agencies something called bulk powers, which allows them to spy on people. The thing is, the agencies don't have to submit any information to the court as to exactly how they got you. That remains a secret. If you're worried about being hacked by the government though, wait until you hear how they can get you without hacking you at all. Number 4. Cops go undercover Sometimes the government doesn't really have to get technical. The authorities can use techniques that they use on the streets. Cops can go undercover. Let's say you're on the dark web and you find a place where you can get the illegal substance MDMA. All the reviews are positive regarding the seller, so you think, ok, I'll take 500 pills because you're in college and you want to pay your tuition fees off. Well, you might just be buying your pills from a cop who's been undercover posing as Rick the Raver, the merchant of Molly. Time and again, cops have done this with drugs, guns, poisons, and images of children. You see, you buy the stuff and you remain anonymous. But you still have to get your contraband delivered, and that's when the cops can grab you. There are ethical concerns though, the cops can't oversell their stuff, they can't say, hey, take these 500 pills but I've got some great cocaine too, do you want that? That's called entrapment. They can't say, take a thousand pills and I'll throw in a gun, that's just not ethical. Then you've got these images of kids that float around the dark web. There's been a lot of controversy regarding the FBI putting out their own images and setting up what's called a honeypot. The problem is, once those images are out, they can be copied and spread all over the web. But you can avoid in-person delivery and avoid an undercover agent, right? Well, if you think other means of scoring your gear are safe, stay tuned. Number 3. The Postal Service you don't have to be set up to have the cops knocking at your door. A huge amount of contraband is seized before it even gets to the buyer. The post office can intercept a package, 
find a few ounces of cocaine, and then they can get in touch with the police. The police can then start an investigation, and while the buyer might not get arrested because the package never arrived, the cops in the past have watched post office videos and have been able to arrest the sender of the package or packages. In other cases, they weren't able to find the seller, so police allowed the post office to deliver the package in what they called a controlled delivery. As soon as you pick it up, they swoop in on you. It's unlikely police will ever get involved if someone is buying, say, one single pill of something. But if the package is big enough, there's always a risk. Sometimes, though, you could get busted, and it's not even your fault. Number 2. A Dealer's Data One outstanding case of someone being caught selling drugs on the dark web was a kid in Germany who was arrested by police in 2015. This 20-year-old guy, who still lived with his mom, was found with a whopping 320 kilograms of drugs in his bedroom. Yeah, you heard that right. He pretty much ran a drug empire from his bedroom and sold drugs from the dark web to people in Germany and in other countries all over the world. He would usually use a P.O. box, not a house or an apartment number, and the person who picked the package was never the person's name on the package. If the person was ever caught picking up the drugs, he or she would say, hey, that's not my name. The thing is, the kid still needed to pick up the drugs. 320 kilos is quite a bit of powder and pills, and it was when he was picking up one of his packages that the cops got him. But guess what? When the cops looked on this kid's hard drive, they found all the names and emails of all the people he'd been selling to. That included guys just buying for personal use, which was not much use to the cops, but it also included bulk buyers who were selling on the streets of Germany and beyond. Someone on the dark web managed to get this kid's profile and leave a message. That message read, dealers run for your lives. That's the thing with the dark web. If someone else gets caught, your information might be on their computer. That kid became a millionaire very fast, but now he's in prison and will be for possibly another decade. The problem is, no sooner than the kid was behind bars, someone else had taken over his dark web domain. Sometimes though, you can get busted without even visiting the dark web. Number 1. Advertising the last way people are caught is when they advertise their dark web marketplace on the very visible normal web that we all use. Yeah, they use the normal web to direct people to the dark web. It's just a little silly, but Ross Ulbricht, the guy that ran the notorious Silk Road marketplace, did just that. He ran ads on a Bitcoin web forum for the Silk Road, and those ads could be traced back to him. For such a smart guy, he definitely missed several big brain moments. Imagine the World Wide Web as an iceberg. Most of what you use is the part above water, the part of the internet you use normally. But there's a part you don't normally see, what lurks beneath the water. Today, we'll look at the darkest parts of the dark web in this episode of The Infographic Show. 11 Scary Things Found on the Dark Web Number 11. Mail Order Drugs We'll start with something that isn't too scary, but it's still quite surprising how many people use the dark web to buy their drugs. According to the Global Drug Survey in 2018, a quarter of British drug users shop for their gear on the dark web. The deliveries usually come by post, and buyers seek good ratings and reviews before they take the risk of sending money. The founder of the survey told the independent newspaper that with all those irksome CCTV cameras in the UK, the dark web and mail delivery was hitting an all-time high. Recent arrests include a guy from Wales who was mailing the dangerous drug fentanyl all over the world. They looked for convenience, product range, quality vendor ratings, said the researcher. He also said that most of the dark web drugs buyers were young. This might not shock some of our wayward viewers, but what's coming is worse. Number 10. Human Products Ok, let's get strange. Like fashion? How about products like belts made out of human flesh? We found someone writing on Quora who said he is familiar with the dark web and said that some of these sites selling human products have a complete loyal customer base. We found a screenshot of the website humanleather.co.uk with this text. All products are carefully handcrafted by experienced master craftsmen with years of experience in handling the finest leather known, human leather. According to one writer, a pair of human shoes will set you back $14,000. You can read threads about this on Reddit. Some say it's fake, but as we haven't made an order, we just don't know. Number 9. Hitmen for Hire Some skeptics write that this is a hoax, that you can't really hire a killer off the dark web. Ok, so the hitman site Basa Mafia did turn out to be a joke, but Fortune published a story in 2015 citing research by a security firm, Trend Micro. It turned out that for $45,000 you could get someone taken care of. For $180,000 it could be someone well known to the public. Apparently, 
you could also get someone beaten or crippled. That's what's advertised anyway. The problem in checking if this is authentic, of course, is paying for a hit and seeing what happens or trying to stop it happening once you find out it's real. Many people are skeptical regarding Hitman sites being real, but we wouldn't like to put it to the test. Number 8. Human Organs and Body Parts some sites on the dark web will tell you they sell human organs. Again, we can't tell you if this is true or not. Gizmodo wrote an article in 2012 with prices of what organs and body parts on the black market would cost. A pair of eyeballs was said to be $1,525, a heart is $119,000, a hand $385, and a kidney $262,000. Illegal organ trafficking certainly does exist, so you might think the dark web would be a good place to open a store. The World Health Organization wrote that each year thousands of organs are bought on the black market, with most of the money going to middlemen, not to those who sold their organs. The Big Think tells us these organs usually come from the poorest reaches of the world and end up in the richest parts of the world. According to Popular Science, a man on Craigslist tried to sell his kidney for $100,000, and he received plenty of offers until his post was taken down. So do we think organs are available on the dark web? Well, it's conceivable. Number 7. Cannibal Forums According to those who know the dark web, there are forums where people who have a taste for human flesh congregate and talk about their unusual predisposition. Some media reports that there was a website called Cannibal Cafe, but that's now closed down. This is where people looking to be eaten or wanting to eat someone would meet, a kind of personal forum for slaughterers and those willing to be slaughtered. There were stories, artwork, and users seeking advice on the best way to cook someone, says one writer who apparently had visited the site. He said that frozen human meat was even for sale. It's not hard to believe if you've heard the story of Armin Maiwis, the German guy who filmed the killing, dissection, and his own consumption of another man who had agreed to be eaten. That happened in 2001, but it's likely this kind of thing has happened without the story ever hitting the media. Number 6. Dead Babies Apparently there's a website dedicated to sharing photos of stillborn children. Now this can be taken in different ways. The Telegraph reported in 2015 that a charity was helping parents with the grieving process by photographing their stillborn child. Why someone would go to the dark web to see someone else's dead baby might just be for help, curiosity, or something far more repugnant. Number 5. Last words Hearing the last words before someone dies can be a saddening thing. There are sites on the dark web apparently committed to finding such recordings. But to be frank, it's not the darkest thing in the world, seeing as it's easy to find the last words of pilots online before their plane hits the ground, a mountain, or just goes up in flames. According to one website, there are places on the dark web where you can hear much more than black box recordings regarding the last words someone said though. Number 4. Pedophilia Web Forums What's perhaps so surprising about this is that it seems a lot of people are into it. There's a thread on Reddit where one guy discusses his time on the dark web, saying he started off just looking at sites selling drugs, guns, fake IDs, etc. But morbid curiosity drove him deeper in. There, he found a website called Bull. He said that he found threads on a forum with titles such as Toddler, 4 Years Plus, 10 Years Plus, or Jailbait. He said Toddler had over 50,000 posts. A cracked writer tells of his time in the dark web saying there's something called Hard Candy, which he said was kind of a Wikipedia for child pornographers. In 2018, the BBC reported about a man sentenced to 32 years. This sadistic pedophile shared abuse tips on the dark web and had 137 charges against him, including numerous charges charges of rape. Number 3. Animal Abuse Anyone with a heart who has seen one of those clips that circulate on the web such as puppies being crushed underfoot or cats being burned alive will likely have that image in their minds forever. Thankfully, it's not something we see often, but apparently on the dark web people go looking for this kind of stuff and they don't have to look too hard. On one site on the dark web called Cruel Onion Wiki, reports say it's closed now, people would post images and videos of the torture and killing of animals. It was very much real. With Motherboard writing in 2014, a site called Cruel Onion Wiki collates links to videos of women killing and torturing animals, usually in a sexualized fashion. Motherboard writes that cats, dogs, bats, rabbits, hamsters, geese, turtles, monkeys, pheasants would be crushed, sat on, or suffocated, often by fully or semi-nude women. An editor watched some of the videos to check the authenticity and left saying he felt horrified. 
Number 2. The Human Experiment Is this a hoax? According to numerous sources, the dark web has a website run by doctors or pseudo-doctors that perform unethical procedures on unwilling patients, usually people off the streets. The tagline on the website reads, not all humans are equal, for some of them were born superior to others. Experiments include pain tolerance, starvation, vivisection, drug trials, transfusions, as well as experiments on babies and pregnant women, and more. The bodies of the dead are dissected and then disposed of in dumpsters of meat shops where their bodies will not be found, it says on the website. The sites itself definitely exists or existed, but the actual experiments may not. We hope not. Motherboard writes that it likely doesn't exist, but certainly there are a few places on the dark web where you can find humans being tortured, but you can also find that on the bright web, the one we use every day. Number 1. Hurtcore and Snuff there are rumors of things called Red Rooms, a kind of pay-per-view live streaming of people being tortured or even murdered. These might be urban legends, however. Australian Peter Scully was arrested for making films where children were being tortured. His film company was called No Limits Fun, and the most infamous film was called Daisy's Destruction. Metro describes this sick movie. Daisy's destruction showed the baby girl being tied upside down by her feet, sexually assaulted, and beaten by Scully and a masked woman. Scully charged people on the dark web $10,000 to watch it. Although the child in the film did not get killed, police found human remains on one of this man's properties. Scully has been sentenced to life in prison for rape and sexual assault, and now faces more charges of torture, abuse against children, and murder. Do snuff films exist? Snopes says no. Most who have investigated them say no. We must remember that people being killed on camera is certainly a thing, but the films were not made for commercial purposes. To this day, it seems there is no evidence of snuff movies, but Hurtcore certainly exists, and we think it's about as low as you can go into the darkest part of the internet. An educated lady, known to be of impeccable character, is sitting at her computer. She pauses for a brief second, looking outside at the night sky, and then writes, with a gun, in the street. $12,000 is fine, just do it ASAP. Whoever's on the other side of that message writes, for $4,000 will throw acid in her face, and for $50,000 will torture her to death. The woman shakes her head, no, just kill her. That's based on a true story, and the person this woman was talking about could have been you. Today you'll hear about hitmen, drug traffickers, killers, even cannibals, who've all at some point been caught up in the darkest part of the internet. You'll hear why this is not a place you should go to, and we'll give you many reasons why. First of all, you should know where you're going when you visit the dark web. In short, it's hidden within something called the deep web. The deep web is just a part of the internet not accessible by your standard search engines, and that makes up most of the net. The dark web accounts for only about 0.01% of the deep web. To get there, you'll have to download certain software on your computer such as the Tor browser. This should give you anonymity, although as you'll see today, it's not always the case. Tor was invented by the US government to create anonymous communications, and today you'll find journalists and activists using it, as more open communication could find them in a spot of trouble. WikiLeaks, for instance, is part of the dark web, although it publishes on the open web. With this in mind, it's not illegal to download some software and start using the dark web, it's what you do with all that anonymity that counts, which is what you're going to hear about in this rather dark show today. Let's also remember that you might just be a curious sort of person who just wants to have a look around the dark web, but by doing this, there's always the chance that you might walk down the wrong virtual alleyway and find yourself in a place you wish you'd never gone. You might also be a marked man after this, or worse. Before we talk about the really creepy stuff on the dark web, we should first talk about drugs, the illegal kind. Some of you might have met a person who told you they ordered the purest drugs they've ever had on the dark web, and it was delivered to their door without a problem. Wow, how convenient. But listen on before you put your order in for a sheet of colorful acid tabs and two dozen ecstasy pills that look like little Lego bricks. You can indeed do this, and many people have, with one former big fan of the dark web drug business calling the place Amazon run by the cartels. He explained that just about any illegal drug you could think of was there on offer, including precursors. You fans of Breaking Bad will know that these are the substances you need to make certain drugs, such as crystal meth. And believe it or not, the sites selling the drugs are often pretty reliable since there is a place to give feedback to the seller. So you might find a comment that says, Great A Coke, and delivered on time, top seller. A few years back, there was a seller with the name of Jesus of Rave. On his site, he stated, in a quite professional way, Working with UK distributors, importers, and producers to source quality, we run a tight ship and aim to get your order out the same or next day. This tight ship also refers to our attitude to you and your privacy. We've been doing this for a long time. 
It seems that ordering drugs on the dark web in Britain really took off a few years ago. There are also lots of recent news reports stating that seizures of ecstasy and amphetamines in the post has increased dramatically, with the drugs mostly coming from the Netherlands after being ordered on the dark web. The Guardian wrote this in 2019. Criminal organizations in the Netherlands are major producers and exporters of synthetic drugs, exported via sea containers or trucks. But there is said to have been a growth in online purchases in which the postal services are exploited. The US, Australia, and New Zealand are the main recipients outside of Europe. The same article said that a sting operation led police to a massive 300 kilograms of drugs and 51 firearms. That same year, a dark web website called the Wall Street Market WSM was shut down in Germany and arrests were made. The owners were making big bucks selling heroin, cocaine, weed, and speed, as well as malicious software, counterfeit documents, and stolen data. It worked in six languages – English, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish. At the time, prosecutors wrote, WSM operated like a conventional e-commerce website, such as eBay or Amazon. However, its sole existence was geared to the trafficking of contraband. As you probably know, the money to be made selling drugs is just so good that arresting dealers or traffickers is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You put one in prison and another pops up. The war on drugs has been nothing but a failure for the most part, with the authorities looking like Sisyphus, the guy who was told he had to push a round rock up a hill for all eternity. This means two things. One thing is that you can be assured that despite these arrests, you can still go on the dark web right now and order pretty much any drug you want. But it also means that you can be assured that some men with badges will be trying to put you in prison for it. This is why it's dangerous. You might think you can get away with it seeing as you have anonymity, but you actually don't. The FBI and other law enforcement entities are all over the dark web. This is the problem with the dark web. You can get eaten by spiders. When people think they have impunity, they can get careless. That's what happened recently when 150 people were arrested in an operation called Dark Huntor. Law enforcement from Europe, the US, and Australia were involved, and about 25 million bucks worth of drugs were taken. In this case, no small-time buyers were arrested, just the sellers, but cops warned about something else. Many of the drugs these days contain the killer substance fentanyl. This stuff works well in hospitals for pain relief and might sound good to a hardcore opiate addict, but the truth is there have been a startling number of news reports, including ones involving famous people, of folks thinking they're taking a drug like cocaine and dying because the white powder also had fentanyl in it. As we write this, five people died all at once of an accidental overdose in the US when they didn't know that their powder contained the drug. But doing a quick search, we could have chosen numerous stories that included the words accidental fentanyl overdose. We don't condone drug use here, but if a person is intent on taking drugs, then the safest thing would be to know what you are taking. When you order from the dark web, you really don't know what you're getting, and since everything is anonymous, the seller might not care too much about what they're giving you. Even if you die, there is very little chance that they'll ever be arrested. We found a story containing the words fentanyl-laced ecstasy tablets. Rave to the grave might be the suitable expression here. Unfortunately, while it could save tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of lives, the authorities for the most part have always been dead set against providing folks with easily available drug testing equipment. On top of this, sometimes the buyers do get arrested. There was a story in 2020 that stated 179 people were arrested in a massive bust involving multiple drugs and guns, and some of those arrested were buyers. Most were in the US, others in the UK, Germany and Sweden, the Netherlands and Austria. At the time, the authorities claimed that the golden age of the dark web marketplace is over. But they've been claiming to be winning the war on drugs since people watched black and white television. Nonetheless, Europol had a warning for prospective buyers and sellers saying, the hidden internet is no longer hidden, and your anonymous activity is not anonymous. Law enforcement is committed to tracking down criminals no matter where they operate, be it on the streets or behind a computer screen. They've even been arresting small-time dealers, as can be seen in one story involving a Florida man. Using the name Da Candy Man, his line of work was mostly the distribution of cocaine. He would send the stuff right to your house via the mail, and guess what? Once he was arrested, the cops also knew where he'd been sending the stuff. We'll add one more thing here. Some people on the dark web might be pretending to sell drugs, but all they're after is your personal information. They're looking to exploit that information, and as you'll soon see, sometimes they can blackmail you. Mostly though, they're fishing in order to get their hands on your money. You can buy fishing kits on the dark web, but you can also be fished. Okay, so maybe drugs aren't your thing. Maybe you're not really into anything illegal, but you do have a very curious mind. When someone told you they had a video of a man being cut up with a chainsaw, you just had to watch it. Freak. Unfortunately, gore sites are all over the open internet, and while it's technically not illegal to post videos of such things as someone being stoned to death, beheaded, or perhaps eating a great big dish of steaming poop, 
Sometimes what you see will forever scar that mind of yours. Unless, of course, you are either desensitized to that kind of thing or a bit on the weird side. That makes up a lot of society, actually, seeing as just one site back in the day called Best Gore was getting in the region of 10 to 20 million hits a month. The owner of Best Gore was eventually arrested after posting the video called One Lunatic, One Ice Pick, which consisted of an eternally unstable maniac named Luca Magnata dismembering a guy then sending some of the body parts to schools and political offices. Obviously, that was a very serious crime and Magnata is now in prison where he belongs. If you know the story, you'll know that before he was arrested, animal activists were also hot on his tail because some of the videos consisted of him doing very bad things to kittens. So maybe one day you get on the dark web and end up seeing something you wish you hadn't. Although we guess right now some of you are thinking that infographic show writers are just big wusses. Maybe gore is nothing to you. According to the Washington Post, much of the worst gore talked about that is supposedly available on the dark web is just that. Talk. You might have heard that you can watch a movie that stars a person being murdered, aka a snuff movie, but they may not actually exist. Some of them are set up and no one dies. Or the rumors about certain films are just rumors. Still, videos of accidental deaths or executions do exist, and it's not illegal for you to watch them. As one writer pointed out, it's illegal to murder somebody, it's illegal to watch somebody get murdered and not report it, but it's not illegal to watch an online snuff film, at least not at the moment. You wouldn't, for instance, have been in trouble if you watched a video that surfaced on the web made by the so-called Dnepropetrovsk maniacs. These two Ukrainian teenagers brutally murdered 21 people in 2007 and they filmed a lot of the violence. For a time, you might have been able to see some of that on gore sites, but not anymore. Still, as we speak, people are going to the dark web to watch similar stuff. One journalist went there to check out such gore, later writing that there is a danger in becoming desensitized to it. He said in an article, I could make you physically sick in minutes by showing you the stuff now, but the second or third or fourth time you see it, you get desensitized to it all. It happens to a lot of people. It creates a lack of empathy in people, and the more you watch, the worse it gets. We don't need to tell you that this isn't good for your mental well-being, but this guy said people get addicted to it. He added, I don't know what drives people to it, it's just pure evil. Why does someone want to watch that? The uncomfortable truth is there's a lot of evil out there. Then you could be down one of those bloody rabbit holes and really see something you wish you hadn't. In the content of a sexual nature that is very much illegal, your curiosity could possibly take you there. In 2019, BBC reported that 337 people were arrested in 38 countries because they were involved in such content. Of the users, the police said they are not as cloaked as they think they are, they're not as safe as they think they are. You never know if you're being watched when you're on the dark web. There was a recent case of a guy in the US that talked on a web forum in the dark web about killing his wife. He asked other people for advice on how he might do it. He wrote, I aim to ensure my wife's death within 18 months, ideally long after our divorce is finalized, about 6 to 8 months from now. This is the only way I can begin a new life with full custody of my child. After some discussion, he came up with poison, which he said might be put in her coffee, wiped on a door handle, or just slipped on her feet while she was asleep. He then tried to buy what the authorities call a chemical weapon. They later explained to the media that it was a colorless, volatile, flammable, and highly toxic liquid that can be easily absorbed through the skin and might produce life-threatening systemic effects with only a single drop. The man bought the chemicals too, paying $95 for a 10 milliliter vial. The problem is the seller was none other than the FBI. Agents arrested him after he went to the place he and asked for it to be mailed. Once in custody, he admitted to the murder plot and said he'd been thinking about using the dark web to hire a hitman, but he told agents that hiring a hitman would be as expensive as getting the divorce. Hiring a hitman on the dark web could also get you in trouble. Not too long back, you could have visited a so-called hitman for hire website on the dark web and found one that stated, if you want to kill someone, we are the right guys. We have professional hitmen available throughout the entire USA, Canada, and Europe, and you can hire a contract killer easily. One guy was told that he could have his wife killed for 6,000 bucks and the death would look like an accident. A bunch of such sites were around back then, with names such as Sicilian Hitman, Drangheta Hitman, Camorra Hitman, Bratva Mafia, and Yakuza Mafia. They were all actually owned by the same person. One site claimed, we offer a large international network of experienced hitmen and provide services to beat up, set fire, or kill customers' targets. We assign hitmen in the same country as the target with the appropriate skills that match the job specifications. The thing was, the guy behind the sites never intended to kill anyone, he just took the money and at times talked to the FBI. There have been instances where someone went on the dark web trying to hire a hitman and after the payment was made, the person got arrested. This happened not long ago with a British doctor, and it later happened to a woman in Denmark for hiring someone to whack her former boyfriend. 
In a very recent case, including a 51-year-old woman in Florida who'd gone to the dark web and tried to hire a hitman to murder the new wife of her ex-boyfriend. She paid $12,000 in Bitcoin and a further $350 for the gun, and all that information was seen by the FBI. The agency also saw her first message which read, I'm looking for a quick hit in southern Florida, is anyone available? This was a woman with a master's degree who had her own financial consulting business and regularly attended church. She was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. The website was just another scam, although it looked real enough. It stated that the prices were $5,000 for death by shooting, $20,000 for death by sniper, and just $2,000 for a good old beating. In another recent case involving a man in Italy, he paid €10,000 or $11,855 in Bitcoin for men to go visit his girlfriend and beat her to death. European police got wind of this, although the news stories didn't exactly state how. In 2020, a woman in Michigan was also hoodwinked by such a website that she believed had 18,000 operatives working worldwide. She gave the site $5,000 to knock off her husband. It turns out that the site was run by a man in the US who never killed anyone but pretended to be a hitman as a way to catch potential criminals. This is a murky area, since such websites might entice folks to want someone killed. The owner of the site told the media that since he'd started it up, he talked to about 400 people who were looking to have someone killed and a few people who wanted to sign up as hitmen. The guy said about 10% of the people he chatted with had legitimate requests, and that's when he informed the cops. The point we're making is when you're on the dark web, you never quite know with whom you're getting involved. We're sure some of you would think it'd be funny to talk to a hitman and pretend you wanted someone killed, but even that could get you in trouble. Still, the owner of the aforementioned site said he always waited a day to ask the person if they still wanted the job done. If they did, he then got on the phone with law enforcement. Talking about one of his first cases, he told the media, I get an email from a woman saying she needed three people murdered. A few hours later, she sent a second email with the names and addresses of the people she wanted killed. The woman was a British Canadian who said the people she wanted dead had stolen the inheritance she should have received from her father. The website owner added she wanted to get even. She was going to stop at nothing. I reached out to a friend who was a sergeant and said, I think this lady is serious. Can we request a welfare check? The friend notified Canadian authorities. She was eventually sent to prison for a few months for soliciting to commit murder. The website owner was proud, saying he helped save the lives of three people, although you have to question if this woman would have had those killed or in the end just killed them herself. The web is full of these stories. One website claimed that it wouldn't just kill people but would torture them to death, although that would set the client back a whopping 50 grand. Painless poisoning was 42 grand, an acid attack, 4 grand, and crippling was $10,000. Not only are these sites scams, but even if a person doesn't get reported to the police, how will they ask for their money back? They don't even know who they've been talking to and there's no way they can go to the cops about their missing money. These days, the newest hitman websites on the dark web tell people that there are all kinds of hitman scams out there, but they are the real deal. One site declared, we can provide video proof of our services with timestamps. Again, such proof is not possible for fake services. Sometimes they'll go to great lengths to look real too, with one website going as far as hiring some dude to set a car on fire and film it just to show the potential client that he meant business. It was later found out that the guy who'd set the car on fire was a man in California who'd contacted the website and said he somehow wanted to get involved with the hitman business. The website in this case was called the Bessa Mafia. It was later talked about in the media after it was discovered that after a man had paid $6,000 to have his wife killed and it never happened, he then killed her himself. There is no shortage of spiders and crazy people on the dark web, which in general is why you ought to give it a wide berth. We can only find one instance where it's been proven that hitmen were hired on the dark web and actually went through with the murder. That was a case in Russia where two teenage boys killed a drug trafficker for a rival drug trafficker. In short, if you go to the dark web and try to hire someone to do something nasty for you, you'll likely just lose a lot of money and then end up in prison. Not long ago, you might have also met a British man named Matthew Falder, a person you could call the embodiment of evil. Using the name 666devil and evil-mind, this guy went on dark web forums and talked about all manner of disgusting things, usually involving young people. His thing was to lure people online into thinking he liked them, and then as time went on, he'd ask them to make very compromising videos of themselves. Since he was well-spoken and seemed sincere, people fell for it. Falder was very educated, holding a position as a geophysicist researcher at Birmingham University. Once he had his hands on the images or videos, he said that if the victims didn't pay him a whack of cash, he'd send the content to everyone they knew. In one message, he told a young victim that he would send the images to everyone on Facebook associated with your school and in letters to your parents and teachers, explaining with printouts of all the pictures that you will strip for money. Most of the victims were naive, and it wasn't that hard for a highly educated maniac to manipulate them. 
In some cases, he told them to film themselves licking toilet seats and eating dog food, after which he posted the content to his many fans on the dark web. He wrote in one post to those fans, Glad you're all enjoying her suffering. And later, I love blackmail, especially forcing someone met online to do things they don't want to for amusement. Imagine visiting websites where people like that post things. Imagine virtually befriending this person and not knowing what you were getting into. Another example of blackmail involved a man who wrote on Reddit that not long ago, he tried to buy drugs on the dark web and had given an address only for him to receive a letter instead of the drugs. The letter stated, congrats, you bleep. You've been participating in illegal activities and we have our eye on you. The man didn't send any cash and the scammer was at best amateurish, but this is just another example of how when you go on the dark web, you're potentially making yourself vulnerable. One other thing some people go on the dark web to do is just pretend to be something they're not, as that in itself can be kind of exciting. These people sometimes roleplay very dark fantasies. This can also get you in trouble, never mind blackmailed if you meet the wrong person. You might have heard of the case of a New York City police officer who got the name the Cannibal Cop. His real name was Gilberto Valley. A few years ago, he was sentenced to a prison term for going on a website called Dark Fetish Net and talking about how he wanted to kill and eat women, including his own wife, the woman who eventually found those disturbing messages on his computer. He didn't just talk about it either, but he had a list of around 100 women whose names and addresses he had thanks to his job as a cop. One of his messages about his wife said that he wanted to let her bleed out, then butcher her while she hangs. It was a big case at the time because this guy really didn't seem like a killer at all. In court, he said his conversations on the forum were all about role-playing and he never intended for anyone to get hurt. He said in court, as time went on, you know, more and more people wanted to do these role-plays with me because I was really good. I kind of wanted to provide and be a little more graphic and not disappoint. Again, the competitive side of me came out. Valley wasn't using the dark web. This stuff was actually out in the open, but make no mistake, there are more people like him on the dark web, a lot more. He was eventually cleared and released from prison, but his case begs the question, just how much can you just talk about crimes online without falling foul of the law? Can you roleplay online or just mess about and get in trouble? We're guessing that some of our viewers would try this with friends just for fun, maybe to see who replied, and to understand the depravity of certain people online, you should probably give that a miss. In 2018, a man in the US went on the dark web and found a forum where he left this post. I'd like to try cannibalism and see how it feels to take a life. If you'd be willing to let me kill you, and are in the US, preferably in the South, and can travel by car, contact me. His name was Alexander Nathan Barter, and at the time he was just 21 years old. First of all, yet again we're showing you what kind of people you might meet on the dark web. But secondly, even if you yourself posted this kind of content as a kind of joke, you should know that not long after, Barter posted the message that was read by an officer working for the Texas Department of Public Safety. That agent replied saying he was willing to give his daughter to Barter for the express purposes, namely for killing and eating. Several other emails were exchanged in which Barter told the agent to meet him and bring a spare set of clothes and a burner phone. In another email he stated, I really want to do this. Barter was arrested on the day the murder was supposed to happen, and on him at his house was a knife and some plastic bags. But was this just part of a dark twisted fantasy, or would he have really done it? The jury thought so and a judge sentenced him to 40 years in prison. In court, the prosecution said, as this chilling case demonstrates, online talk is not always just talk. The constant vigilance of our law enforcement partners has prevented an evildoer from finding a like-minded accomplice and bringing his grisly plan to fruition. A site that no longer exists on the open web was called the Cannibal Cafe. When it was still up, you could have read posts with titles such as, I really fantasize about being butchered, roasted, and eaten. Then in 2001, a computer specialist in Germany named Armin Maiwes killed a man he found on that forum. His victim was Bernd Jürgen Armando Brandes. Both men were in their 40s when they agreed to go through with it. The two men met, and let's just say what happened was one of the strangest dates in history. And in the end, bits of Brandes ended up in Maiwes' freezer, and the cannibalistic fetishes he'd had since he was a child became a reality. He also ended up in prison. Maiwes told the court that for many years he'd only fantasized about doing such things, but it was when he found a real-life cannibalism website that things moved from fantasy to possibility. He added, if I hadn't been so stupid as to keep looking on the internet, I would have taken my secret to the grave. As we said, his interactions with his victim happened on the open web, but that was back in the day. These days, if you want to talk shop about eating people, you'd struggle to do that out in the open virtual space. As we showed you with the Texan guy, the dark web is the place to go for that kind of thing these days. You might find a forum with someone saying something like this. Real dark web comment. I need someone to eat my fresh meat. I am juicy and tender. But we are guessing most of these people are just messing around for the sake of being a bit naughty. 
Still, now you know that law enforcement could be reading such messages, and we don't recommend risking playing around. As another example, one guy we found said he did a bit of messing around on the dark web. He later said on a forum, I was trying to make a small explosive for a dumb little movie I was going to make with my friends. I found myself in the dark corners of the internet. One site in particular had a text document downloaded talking about how to sneak explosives past metal detectors. NSA is probably all over me right now. He could be right. There might not be any red rooms on the dark web or hitmen who will torture your ex to death or ghastly human experiments with homeless people, but there are certainly sexual deviants and torture fans only too happy to share content with you. There might be the odd person who wants to chat about eating human eyeballs with you. There's a long list of folks who want to sell you guns, drugs, and someone's personal data. Those people might also be law enforcement or blackmailers. Unless you're depraved, desperately drug addicted, downright evil, or a dedicated journalist or activist in hiding, then why would you go there? The real reason you shouldn't visit the dark web is there's just no point, and if you aren't any of the things we just mentioned, there really is no reason at all. Pandora's box, as full of snakes as it is, is best left locked. Even if you do manage to get yourself flagged by law enforcement or scammed by a heartless fiend, you'll have to wade through a lot of junk to get there. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial today by signing up at audible.com infographics. Go to audible.com slash infographics or text infographics to 500-500 to get started. Beneath the surface of the World Wide Web, there's a hidden world. The dark web is, at first glance, a murky world populated by criminals and the sexually depraved. Here you can hire hitmen, compare the latest recipes for the preparation of human meat, and browse the most cruel, immoral, and illegal pornography known to man. But how easy is it to access this netherworld? Do we need special permission from some shady figure on some dark forum to gain access to the dark web? Or do we require some special technical skills to enter this domain of depravity? Today we find out just what strange content populates this dark underworld in this episode of the infographic show, The Dark Web. First of all, just what is the dark web? The dark web forms a small part of the deep web and is not indexed by search engines. That means it can't be found through the likes of Google, Yahoo, Bing, and so forth. This is uncharted territory for the everyday internet user as we usually use the main search engines to surf our content. Instead, the deep web is explored with peer-to-peer -peer networks along with larger networks such as Tor, I2P, and Freenet. Identities and locations of users on the dark web are kept secret through a layered encryption technology. While most of the content on the deep web contains nothing bone-chillingly sinister, in fact, much of the content is large databases, libraries, and members-only websites and academic resources, the content that is anonymous, and therefore considered morally questionable, is considered to belong to the dark side of the deep web, the darknet. To further confuse matters, the dark web isn't the same as the dark internet, the latter being the place where scientists store raw data for research. Government agencies are, in theory, supposed to be able to track some of the characters behind this anonymous dark web space, but it is tricky and requires an infinite amount of resources and isn't always successful. But sometimes they hit the jackpot. On July 5th, 2017, 26-year-old Canadian Alexander Kazes was found dead in a Thai police cell after intelligence agencies discovered his whereabouts. He had been running a massive dark web marketplace selling drugs, weapons, and other contraband on the underground website Alphabay. Kazes lived a life of luxury in Thailand, owning three houses and four cars, one of which was a Lamborghini. A computer expert slash nerd who had amassed a fortune in Bitcoin, Kazes had his hand in the dark cookie jar when the law finally caught up with him. Rather than face extradition to a western prison, Kazes chose to commit suicide in a Thai holding cell where he was found by local cops. So be warned, the dark web isn't for the faint of heart, and some of those who travel down there and make a living down there never, ever return. So let's take a trip down into the dark recesses of the internet. Grab a flashlight and follow us as we travel down into these black markets and seedy chat rooms. The dark net, as we found out, is a venue for illegal trade in drugs, weapons, and controlled animal products. But it is also a place where deviant criminals such as pedophiles and terrorists exchange gossip on forums. It is a dark and dirty place, and if you're thinking of taking a trip there, you better prepare to brush cyber shoulders with some of society's outcasts. Just when you think you've discovered the most morally repulsive website, another one pops up. A 2014 study carried out by the University of Portsmouth discovered that the most common content on Tor was child pornography. Other brands of sick content include animal porn and revenge porn and perhaps even animal revenge porn. It is also a place for hackers to hang out. Groups such as Xdedic, 
Hack Forum, Trojan Forge, and The Real Deal meet up here, and in a strange twist of cyber fate, some of these groups have been known to target and uncover the pedophile groups who also hang out there. So in some instances, the dark web polices itself. Other questionable content to be found on the dark web include recipes for cooking human meat and sites to hire a hitman. Whether the sites offer practical services or are of a more entertainment nature is open to conjecture. You will also find political whistleblowing sites and cyber currency discussion sites. Travel on the dark side is notoriously slow, so don't be expecting a lightning fast dark vacation in hell. With traffic bouncing through the computers of volunteer networks, the traffic is continually encrypted and pushed through multiple proxies, meaning some pages will sit there haunting you for apparent eternity. If you feel it's time to dip your toe in this murky pond, know that technically it's not that difficult to get there. You will need to install Tor and use the Vidalia control panel. Some users recommend putting a strip of tape over your webcam to prevent dark eyes from watching you as you surf. A tinfoil hat is also optional. If you do travel down there to the dark side, be safe and be warned that you may discover something even more disturbing than the things we already mentioned. You could be one click away from something that will change your perception of the world forever. It's late one night and you can't sleep. You toss and turn but can't seem to doze off. So you pull out your computer and head to some of your frequented online forums. You're on your favorite subreddit, r slash infographic show, when suddenly a pop-up blocks your screen. The box is all black with red lettering. It reads, do you like the red room? The red room, you think? What's that? You shrug and go to close the pop-up. As soon as you click on the creepy message, another window appears. A list of people's names who have accessed a red room before begins scrolling across your screen. The list ends. An ominous message is left for you to read. It says everyone who has accessed the red room is now dead. Will you be next? You slam your laptop shut and sit in the darkness. You're breathing heavily as sweat pours down your face. Well, that was creepy, you think? Your curiosity gets the better of you, and you begin doing research on what red rooms are. One of the first things you find after a quick search is an account from a blogger who knows about red rooms. The blogger explains he knows a friend of a friend who once paid to view a red room on the dark web using cryptocurrency. The red room user went deep into the dark web using the anonymous browser called Tor. It was the only way to watch the real red rooms because of the insane stuff that happens in them. The user logged in and waited. The live stream video was of a room covered in translucent tarps. In the middle of the room was a chair. In the top right hand corner of the screen was a countdown. The user had three minutes to wait before the show would begin. When the countdown got to zero, one of the tarps was pulled back. A tied up man was escorted in by a hooded figure. The captive was secured in the chair and the hooded figure left the room. He then came back with a pushcart piled high with tools and instruments of torture. The man tied to the chair began to scream and plead for mercy, but there was none to be had in the red room. The user was able to vote for different ways to torture the man. The executioner would read the messages and do it, but there was a catch. The user said that in order to suggest a torture, people watching the stream had to pay using untraceable cryptocurrency. The person with the highest payment got their torture of choice carried out. The user explained that this went on for around 20 minutes until someone made a monstrous donation to have the captive killed. The execution was carried out live on the Red Room video for all to see. You are a bit skeptical that something as horrible as torture and murder could be found on the internet. Also, this description, like every account of Red Rooms that you find, all happen to be second, third, or fourth hand accounts. It seems like Red Rooms are tied to the dark web, yet when you do a quick Google search for Red Rooms, a bunch of sites come up. Yeah, they're all scams or old sites that no longer work, but they were relatively easy to find. This makes you think that people made up Red Rooms to scam others and it evolved into an urban legend. But the weird pop-up from earlier in the night still haunts you. You need to learn more. You decide to uncover more about what the dark web is and how it's tied to Red Rooms. After some research, you find that the dark web is a relatively small collection of websites that are not indexed by search engines such as Google or Yahoo. In fact, you discover that there are only about 2,000 unindexed sites that make up the dark web. When you compare this to the regular internet, which contains well over a billion sites, you're surprised at how small of a niche the dark web actually makes up of total virtual content. Supposedly, the only way to access these sites is to use open source anonymity tools to uncover the hidden IP addresses. Browsers like Tor make it incredibly difficult to determine what is on the dark web and who is there unless you know what you're looking for. 
The dark web is based around anonymity, so it appeals to bad people doing bad things. You scour the internet for more information about red rooms. It's clear they are video streams of people doing terrible things like torture and murder. But do they really exist? Can you actually find one that's streaming live? From everything you've read, it seems unlikely. Most videos that claim to be red rooms are obviously just scams trying to steal people's money. What a time to be alive, you say sarcastically. As you go deeper and deeper into your research, you find an interesting rumor. It's claimed that the term Red Room has been around for decades. The name may have its origins in the movie The Shining, where red rum is written out in lipstick on a door. Later, the movie reveals that what is really being written is murder backwards. Another hypothesis of where Red Rooms got their name is from the 1983 horror film Videodrome. In this movie, torture is shown on live TV in a room painted red. Both ideas for the name of Red Rooms seem plausible. What doesn't seem plausible is that they actually exist on the internet. People have been known to do terrible things on the internet, especially when their identity is a secret. You don't have to go to the dark web to find websites geared toward racism, hate, and cybercrime. All of that can be found right on the regular internet. As you dive deeper into your research on the twisted world of the dark web, you come across a site that's claiming to be currently live streaming a red room. You're hesitant, but you need to know if it's real, so you click the link. It takes you to a video in progress. You think it's odd that a Red Room video would be easily accessible on the regular internet, but like so many others, your curiosity gets the better of you. The video in progress shows a woman being tortured by a man. The torturer is using different tools to inflict pain. Blood sprays everywhere. The man disappears behind a curtain. This can't be real, you think. He comes back into view as the shrieks of the hysteric captive fill the room. In his hand is a bone saw. A look of terror crosses the female's face. She struggles against the ropes, holding her onto the top of a wooden table. The man holds up the saw and brings it down onto one of the female's squirming legs. He puts his back to the camera and begins sawing. He's blocking the actual leg, but you can hear the screams and see the spraying blood covering the tarps that line the room. You're horrified. But what is even more scary than the Red Room are the comments of the anonymous watchers. They seem to be enjoying the torture. They're making suggestions on what to do next. You can't stand it anymore. You pull yourself out of the shock and grab your cell phone. You're about to call the police when the screaming stops. The man turns toward the camera and smiles. The female sits up, unties the ropes, and hops off the table. They take a bow. It was all just a show. No real torture happened, but it was still really messed up. Now, you're convinced that Red Rooms are either scams or gruesome staged videos where no one is actually tortured or killed. But then you stumble across claims that have been circulating the dark web forums. The rumors say Islamic State terrorists have been captured and will be tortured in a Red Room. The live stream is set to begin in just a few minutes. This seems like a twisted form of justice, but could it be real? Deep in the dark web, the site where the Islamic State fighters are to be tortured and killed goes live. A countdown starts. More and more people join the Red Room live stream. There's a lot of hype around this video. It seems legit. But right before the Red Room is about to begin, the site is taken offline. Hours later, the site comes back with a page that thanks everyone for watching and a 21-minute video of a guy being force-fed bacon. It seems like it was all a hoax. Yet again, the Red Room was a fake. You uncover no real evidence that Red Rooms currently exist or have ever existed. At this point, you're convinced that Red Rooms are all just an urban legend. As you look back at all of the research you did over the past few hours, you find holes in the Red Room myths. For example, the Tor software may allow people to remain anonymous on the dark web, but due to restrictions in what can be run, it's virtually impossible to stream any videos. The buffer rate would just be too slow to be viable. Also, the fact that there is virtually no first-hand evidence of a Red Room viewing is a big red flag. All accounts are from people who heard rumors from a friend, or an account that was found on forums that can't be verified. It would seem the Red Room urban legend has captivated the minds of people who search for crazy stuff on the dark web, but no real evidence for their hmm. existence has been uncovered. Maybe it's because people are too ashamed of what they did or saw. But people are not too ashamed to cyberbully or spread hate on the internet, so watching a Red Room video does not seem to be something people would be afraid to admit they've done. Even on the dark web, people can be found, given enough time and resources. The FBI and other law enforcement agencies have arrested people who engage in child pornography on the dark web. If Red Rooms existed, there's no reason to assume that people committing torture and murder would not eventually be apprehended. This is just more evidence that the Red Rooms do not actually exist. There are clearly terrible people doing terrible things on the dark web and the regular internet, but when laws are broken, they tend to be brought to justice one way or another. There have also 
Zipin reports that hackers who use their abilities for good have analyzed a number of different dark websites such as Red Rooms. They found these sites not to be genuine. One hacker named Cthulhu analyzed a number of dark websites and found they were set up with no real concern for security. If terrible things are happening in Red Rooms, which could land the creator in jail, you would think security should be their number one priority, but this does not seem to be the case, which means that the Red Room sites are most likely scams or fakes. You close your laptop and lay back in bed. You're relieved that the horrors of Red Rooms have been shown to be fake, but deep down inside you know that people are capable of some crazy things. Maybe if you went deeper and deeper into the black hole of the dark web, you would find a real Red Room. It's a scary thought, but the internet can be a scary place. You lay awake looking at the ceiling. So much for trying to go back to sleep, you think. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password to keep all your online accounts secure. The dark web can be considered dark for a variety of reasons. It's dark in the sense that it's largely hidden from the public view. It's made up of encrypted networks that can only be accessed with special browsers such as Tor. This encryption allows users to have an anonymity that keeps their identities mostly but not completely in the dark. And then there's its dark content. While the dark web contains harmless and other helpful websites, it's best known as a black market for illegal items and a breeding ground for other criminal and inhumane activities. We'll present five strange stories from this part of the internet in today's episode of the Infographic Show. Most Bizarre Dark Web Stories 5. Red Rooms The existence of Red Rooms is the most popular myth about the dark web. According to journalist Eileen Ormsby, a Red Room is a website that offers pay-per-view live streaming of someone being tortured and or killed. Red Rooms can be interactive too, paying viewers have the opportunity to type in torture commands in a chat box. Red Rooms are generally thought to be an urban legend due to a lack of solid evidence that they exist. According to a Washington Post article, there is not much more proof of their existence other than people on Reddit 4chan in the hidden wiki, trading second and third and fourth hands accounts of Red Rooms open and closed. In addition, the article points out that Red Rooms and such operations have never been busted by the FBI's increasingly frequent dark web raids. What also makes people People doubt the existence of Red Rooms are the fake ones that have popped up over the years, such as one that created a stir amongst 4chan and Reddit users in 2015. According to a Motherboard article, the site's owner humorously promised there would be bacon. But the live torture turned out to be nothing more than footage of a man being forced to eat bacon. 4. The Human Experiment A bizarre dark web website that seems like an urban legend is called The Human Experiment. The website presents the chilling story of what these experiments involve. Test subjects, who are usually homeless people that are unregistered citizens, are taken to one of four warehouses where doctors and medical students perform brutal and unethical experiments, such as vivisection, sterilization, and drug trials. There are even tests for neonate and infant tolerances to x-rays, heat, and pressure. The test subjects usually don't live very long and the website goes into gruesome detail about what happens to them after they die from the experiments. The bodies of the dead are dissected and then disposed of in dumpsters and meat shops, where their bodies will not be found. The thought catalog cautions that we may never know whether the human experiment is real or just an elaborate hoax. 3. Cannibal Victim Ad in 2018, a 21-year-old Texas man named Alexander Nathan Barter went on the dark web on a horrifying mission. His plan was to find a young girl he could rape, kill, and eat. According to a Daily Mail article, he allegedly wrote a dark web posting for anyone willing to let him eat a young girl and then have sex with the corpse. Instead of finding a victim, however, he caught the attention of an undercover agent. The agent pretended to be a parent, willing to offer up his daughter to him. Barter and the agent set up a meeting via email. Authorities were able to trace the dark web posting to Barter by subpoenaing subscriber information and IP logs, so they were able to arrest him outside of his home on the day of the meeting. He was found with a plastic trash bag and a knife. Barter was jailed and charged with several felonies, including criminal solicitation, attempted capital murder, conspiracy to commit capital murder, and attempted sexual performance of a child. 2. Churchman Hires Hitman on Dark Web a 44-year-old Minnesota man named Stephen Alwine wanted his wife Amy dead. In February 2016, he attempted to hire someone to kill her on the dark web, choosing Bessa Mafia for the job. 
Months passed and Amy was still alive. According to Fox 9, the FBI eventually informed Stephen and Amy Allwine that agents had shut down a phony murder-for-hire operation on the so-called darknet called Bessa Mafia. They also learned that someone with the name Dog Day God had transferred $12,000 in untraceable Bitcoin in an attempt to hire a hitman to kill Amy, although some sources say the amount was $6,000. Despite this setback, Allwine would not give up. He came up with another plan to kill her. This time, he would do it himself. A Washington Post article reported that he got a permit for a 9mm Springfield XDS handgun in August 2016. This didn't raise any suspicion because local law enforcement suggested they get increased security. It would be the same gun found near Amy's body on November 13, 2016. She died in her bedroom with a single gunshot wound to her head in what initially appeared to be a suicide. However, a growing body of evidence pointed to Stephen Allwine as her murderer. According to the Washington Post, there was physical evidence. For instance, there was no gunpowder and blood found on Amy's hands, but gunshot shot residue was found on Steven's right hand. Another important piece of evidence from Amy Allwine's autopsy was the discovery of a large amount of scopolamine, a nausea treatment that can incapacitate someone who takes high doses. She had no prescription for the drug. Digital evidence linking Allwine to his wife's murder also emerged. Fox 9 reported that the computer forensic expert Mark Lanterman discovered a 34-digit Bitcoin address on Allwine's computer. Lanterman found it matched the same address obtained when FBI agents shut down Bessa Mafia, and apparently Allwine was dumb enough to purchase scopolamine under the same alias he used to hire the hit on his wife. A detective discovered Dog Day God also attempted to buy the anti-nausea drug scopolamine on a darknet site called Dream Market. In February 2018, Allwine was found guilty of his wife's murder and sentenced to life in prison, without the possibility of parole for his crime. Some of the circumstances leading Allwine to kill his wife are just as bizarre as the killing itself. Before the murder, Allwine was a church elder at the United Church of God in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. One of its church duties included acting as a marriage counselor to troubled couples in his congregation. After learning about the infamous adultery website Ashley Madison from his marriage counseling sessions, he ironically began using the service himself. According to the Washington Post, he allegedly had affairs with at least two women he met on the site. He wanted to end his marriage, but he had a high position in a conservative church that looked down upon divorce. In his twisted mind, killing Amy seemed to be the best solution to his problem. 1. Sad Satan Sad Satan is a video game that was supposedly discovered on the dark web in 2015. One horror news website called The 13th Floor describes it as a weird, semi-abstract horror game made up of black and white visuals, obscure ghost children, and a soundtrack of famous serial killers like John Wayne Gacy and Charles Manson. It also features disturbing images such as satanic and Nazi imagery and creepy backwards speech and music. Oddly enough, there seems to be a message about child abuse in the game. The children are the one who abuse the player in Sad Satan. According to TV Tropes, they eventually follow him and harm the player in some version of the game, leading to the player's demise. Sad Satan may seem like an aimless and badly made walkthrough game, but it's far from harmless. The game was featured on a YouTube channel called Obscure Horror Corner or OHC. The owner of OHC told gaming website Kotaku that he downloaded it from an Onion site on the recommendation of a subscriber, but OHC's owner eventually had to delete the game because it came with a file that freaked him out. According to TV Tropes, OHC's owner also eventually admitted that he posted the wrong link to the game on his YouTube channel after he discovered the game contained illegal images of minors and actual snuff that he did not want to spread on the internet. Different versions of the game have been made over the years. There are some clean clones, but others are not. Besides graphic and horrific content, TV Trope states that some versions of the game are downright dangerous to play because they mangle your computer. There has been a lot of speculation about why the game was made. The 13th Floor states that some people believe it's a sting from police or a recruiting tool for cults. One news website presents the possibility that the game might have been the starting point for an alternate reality game or part of some narrative project or viral marketing scheme. According to TV Tropes, another theory is that the game was part of a publicity stunt to popularize OHC. We may never know if this theory is accurate. While the game has remained in the spotlight, OHC's owner has disappeared along with the original version version of the game. The dark web can be home to some pretty bizarre stuff. You've heard all the rumors. Illegal weapons, illicit drugs, even hitmen for hire. We're sure you're not in the market for anything unsavory or illegal, but you might be tempted to see for yourself if any of those dark web urban legends are true. We definitely don't recommend that you visit the dark web. We don't want that on our conscience. 
Instead, this video will save you a potentially dangerous trip to the dark web and answer your most burning questions about the craziest things sold on the dark web. First of all, what is the dark web anyway? The best way to understand the dark web is to think of it as an iceberg. The clear net, the part of the internet that most of us are familiar with, is like the tip of the iceberg sticking out above the water. It's the visible part of the internet that can be accessed through search engines like Google, but it only accounts for about 10% of the whole internet. The deep web is like the rest of the iceberg, it's hidden under the water. It makes up the bulk of the whole internet. The deep web contains over 90% of the information on the internet. People tend to fear what they don't understand, but the majority of the deep web is pretty harmless, and it actually might even be helpful. Back in the 70s when the internet was just getting started, the terms dark web and deep web weren't ominous. They simply referred to the parts of the internet that weren't connected to the mainstream internet and weren't indexed by search engines. Because it's unindexed, it's incredibly hard to navigate this information without the help of Google. Some deep web search engines like Candle do exist, but without indexing it's incredibly hard to sort through the massive amount of information on the deep web. So how can the deep web be good? Well, those of us lucky to have unrestricted internet access might take it for granted, but that free access is not a given everywhere in the world. In countries where internet access is restricted, the deep web is essential for connecting people to others within their country and with the outside world. Even those of us with unrestricted internet access might prefer the privacy and anonymity of the deep web. The deep web provides access to secure email servers like ProtonMail and has mirror social media and news sites like Facebook and the New York Times. The deep web news outlet ProPublica was actually the first online news site to win a coveted Pulitzer Prize. There's a dark web version of Reddit called Hidden Answers and even places for journalists and whistleblowers to upload documents and sensitive info. All these sites allow people in more restrictive countries to communicate freely within and outside of their country. In fact, communication through the deep web was instrumental in the Arab Spring uprising of 2010. In the age of big data, even those with unrestricted internet access and nothing to hide might prefer not to have their every online move monitored. And the deep web offers a convenient place to browse in privacy and connect with a community of like-minded individuals. A lot of activity on the deep web is pretty mundane. It ranges from the downright boring, like Just Chess, a site where you can just play chess with other users, to the mildly naughty, like pirating movies on Pirate Bay, to the straight up weird, like Kittens, a site exclusively dedicated to cute cat pictures. For some reason, the deep web seems to have a thing for cats. For all those benefits, the deep net definitely has a seedy underbelly. This is the part of the deep web that we call the dark web. It makes up only about 6% of the total internet, and it's home to all sorts of dangerous, illegal, and just plain strange things. Accessing any part of the deep web is far from simple, and you need special browsers and location masking software to access onions or highly specified URLs. Privacy and anonymity are core values of the deep web, and this is especially true in the seedier dark web. Some of the more sketchy dark web sites might even have their own vetting processes, where you might be required to perform a potentially illegal or immoral act to prove that you're a serious customer and not just a nosy researcher or even a law enforcement official. It's important to remember that there's no oversight on the dark web, which means there's nowhere to turn if you're the victim of a scam or a malware attack. There's also the risk that you could become involved in a law enforcement sting. One of the most prolific dark web myths is that you can hire a hitman to take out your enemies, but in reality, all of those hitman for hire sites have turned out to be scams. Either the hitman turns out to be a fake and just pockets your money, or the hitman is actually law enforcement officers in disguise. The dark web is home to countless marketplaces peddling everything from stolen goods to designer knockoffs. Due to pressure from law enforcement and a culture of secrecy, these marketplaces are constantly popping up, moving, and disappearing. The Silk Road was one of the first dark web marketplaces, and it was estimated to have earned more than a billion dollars in revenue, mostly from the sale of drugs, before it was shut down by the FBI in 2014. In 2019, the Dream Market, another major player in the dark web drug trade, gave its users 30 days notice that it would be closing, leading many to assume that the site had been taken over by law enforcement and was being run as a honeypot operation. Now that you know the basics of the dark web and you've been duly warned about its dangers and risks, without further ado, let's take a look at some of the craziest things that are sold on the dark web. Cryptocurrency Services Bitcoin is the unofficial currency of the dark web. Since dark web users are all about privacy and untraceability, 
Cryptocurrency is the perfect currency for the types of transactions that happen on the dark web, especially the illegal ones. The deep web is full of services for buying, selling, and storing Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. But the dark web takes it a step further. You can find services that will clean or launder your Bitcoin, adding another layer of untraceability to your transaction. There are even illegal Bitcoin lotteries and dark web casinos where you can win real Bitcoin payouts and skip the taxes usually applied to lottery winnings. Fake Documents Probably one of the more tame things you can find on the dark web is a plethora of fake documents. You can get fake IDs, fake birth certificates, and of course, fake passports. There's even a site that purports to sell valid American citizenships. But perhaps the weirdest fake document you can get on the dark web? Fake college degrees. We guess that's one way to pad your resume. Illegal Weapons Weapons, especially guns, are one of the most popular items sold on the dark web. Although guns are easy to get in many countries like America, it's definitely not the case elsewhere in the world. Plus, you may not want your gun registered, so the dark web offers an additional layer of anonymity. And guns are just the beginning. You can buy all kinds of weapons like explosives and even uranium. Illicit Drugs Another mainstay of the dark web is a thriving market for drugs of all kinds. The dark web's drug market has come a long way from just being a sneaky way to buy weed. Now that marijuana is becoming legal in many places, people are turning to the dark web for the heavier stuff. Not only can you find all kinds of street drugs like cocaine and heroin, but there's now a huge market for fake pharmaceuticals. For years, a small operation in the UK was able to use dark web marketplaces to elude law enforcement as they peddled an estimated 1.5 million fake Xanax pills to British customers, creating an addiction crisis in the process. The dark web even has its own brand of discount Viagra called Camagra, with its own dedicated marketplace. I guess some people are desperate to avoid those embarrassing doctor's visits. Hacked Data We are constantly hearing stories about companies' data being hacked, but we rarely hear about what happens to all that stolen data. Most of it actually ends up for sale on the dark web. For a few dollars, you can get a package of hundreds of credit cards and social security numbers. Most of them will have been cancelled or protected by then. But if you're lucky, you might find a few to use in your nefarious endeavors. You can even find services on the dark web that will help you use this new data. Like, for example, by helping you get a fake loan under an assumed identity. Hacker Tools for those DIYers out there, dark web is the place to learn how to become a world-class hacker. With step-by-step -step guides, ready-made malware and viruses, and physical tools like credit card scanners and ATM skimmers, the dark web is a hacker's one-stop shop. Hackers for Hire If you don't consider yourself to be tech-savvy enough to do your own hacking, never fear, you can find hackers for hire on the dark web. Markets like Digital Gangster connect you with legitimate hackers who can help you with everything from retrieving passwords to hacking into another person's computer. While tempting, this seems pretty risky to us after all. Who's to say the hackers won't turn on you? Knockoffs and Fake Products No black market would be complete without a thriving trade in designer knockoffs. Of course, you can find that standard fake Rolex and knockoff Chanel purse, but the dark web has much more to offer. You can find sites dedicated to the sale of gold and diamonds, and custom 3D printing is becoming hugely popular. One of the most printed products? Gun parts. Not surprisingly, technology is a huge seller on the dark web. Where else can you get so-called genuine Apple products at deeply discounted prices? That's right, the dark web. Fake Accounts Some of the most popular fakes found on the dark web are fake user accounts for popular services. You can find lifetime Netflix accounts that will never expire, or score free rides using hacked Uber accounts. This is definitely one of the weirdest kind of fakes we found on the dark web, and it had us wondering, why bother? Twitter followers. In the age of social media, everyone is competing for likes, and it can sometimes seem like people will do anything to get more followers. Yet again, the dark web comes to your rescue, and you can actually buy Twitter followers, or more accurately, bots, to inflate your social media status. If nothing you've heard so far seems that crazy to you, just wait until you hear about this one. Apparently, you can also buy souls on the dark web. In some countries, it's believed that spirits can be trapped at the moment of death and harnessed to perform powerful rituals. The dark web has brought this trade into the 21st century, making it easier than ever to purchase the soul of a recently departed person for a hefty sum, of course. And who can forget the dark web mystery boxes? This viral dark web trend was based on a long-standing practice that started on eBay. But unlike the eBay boxes, which contained harmless items like tech gear and clothing, the mystery boxes from the dark web contained random and terrifying objects. 
like children's clothes, evil objects, and even items with what looked like blood on them. People fear what they don't understand. Most of the deep web is harmless and actually an important tool for free speech, but the dark web is the seedy underbelly of the deep web, and if you can think of it, someone is probably selling it on the dark web, including some illegal, immoral, and just plain crazy things. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. If you've seen our previous shows on the dark web, you should know now what you can find there and how to find it. As you know, the dark web can be accessed through what's called the Tor browser. Once you're in, you should have complete anonymity, meaning no one can track your IP address. What kinds of things can you find there? Well, as you also likely know, the dark web is full of people selling illegal things such as drugs. But there have also been reports of people even hiring hitmen through the dark web. People might also go there just to talk to other people about their illness, their strange habits, their darkest secrets. Today, we're going to unravel something a little more mysterious in this episode of The Infographics Show. Can you really order a mystery box from the dark web? Let's first explain a phenomenon known as unboxing, as not all of you follow the same trends. Around a decade ago, people would appear on YouTube literally taking things out of boxes. This might just be people unboxing tech products and then explaining how that product works, reviewing it, playing around with it. This became such a hit that companies would soon start doing their own unboxing videos or sending their products to popular channels to be unboxed. It's not all about how-to videos, though. One of the most popular channels is Ryan's Toy Review, in which a 7-year-old kid opens toys. Simple perhaps, but Forbes reported that this channel made in the region of $11 million in 2017. We bet you wish you'd have come up with that concept. But for some people, the thought of watching people take things out of the box and talk about what's inside is quite dull. But what if what was inside the box was a little more exciting than an iPhone iteration or a miniature plastic Tyrannosaurus Rex made in China? That's where today's focus comes in. You see, a new trend is people allegedly ordering mystery boxes from the dark web and then opening them up on YouTube. YouTube or other video platforms. As you can imagine, what's inside is generally not suitable for 7-year-olds and often doesn't come with a digital personal assistant. The media tells us that in 2018, hundreds of YouTubers have been unboxing stuff they bought in marketplaces on the dark web, and millions of people have been tuning in. Just search for this on YouTube and you can find lots of videos, mostly containing young men expressing their shock while taking things out of boxes. Oh my god, there's blood on it, one man says in a particular video while a car baby chair is being taken out of the box. The question is, how real is all this? Could you not just set that up from your own home using ketchup bloodied props or bags of baking soda you bought from the brightly lit supermarket? The Australian media tells us that indeed people anonymously sell these boxes on the dark web and they go for any Thing from $100 to $1,000. Those boxes have included girls' backpacks, bloodied screwdrivers, and at times, they've even been empty. In another video on YouTube, one unboxer finds a note that reads, Dear friend, life is a mystery, a very, very dirty mystery. At times, you never know what you are touching or what you are leaving behind. He's then told to wear gloves while he opens the box, and he subsequently takes out the contents. Those contents are a bag of white powder, a tool with a biohazard sticker on it, and a CD. He plays the CD and he hears children's voices, through which he hears the sound of a voice saying, I see you. Scary? Well, that depends on your disposition and perhaps if you can suspend belief, because maybe all of this is just fiction. But the fact is, if you have a look in the dark web, you can certainly find these mystery boxes. Have a look if you don't believe us. The fact this is possible is rather unnerving given that the box is untraceable. There is likely a very small chance that something horrible could turn up in a box, rather than a Hello Kitty school bag. Mashable tells us this, although a lot of this may sound alarming, there's also a strong possibility that some of these unboxing videos are faked as means of getting views and obtaining ad revenue. Yep, Mashable, we think most people are aware of this. It seems fairly obvious to most of us that if someone really did buy one of these boxes on the dark web and then video the contents being opened, if those contents could lead to a criminal charge or at least start a criminal investigation, then that video would not appear on YouTube. Sometimes the opening of these boxes is called the deep web challenge, but one must always be skeptical regarding how challenging the unboxing really is. 
Perhaps the biggest challenge is acting shocked, shamed, surprised, disconcerted while making some creepy form of entertainment. Now we go over to Reddit, where one person writes this in the intro of a long piece of writing. I don't know why I didn't realize a clear majority of these videos are fake and staged for the scare factor, but I didn't. Lo and behold though, when he finally gets around to purchasing a box, he is shocked to find something that chills his bones. It's a book, he says, that contains photos of the house he grew up in. Each numbered page contains a Polaroid, photos of places, things, but one page, he says, contained a picture of a mask, handcuffs, a gag, and a bottle of some sort of drug it looked like. He sees his own parents tied up, his self as a kid. Oh, and then he throws the book away and he sees a hooded figure looking through his window. It turned out by ordering this box, he got his parents killed. What this is, of course, is an old trope used in horror movies, wherein an added bit of realism is used in the form of skepticism, i.e., I don't believe in the boogeyman, but then this happened to me. It's basically the campfire ghost story, and the best ones use realism to get you listening and then throw in the scare. Other stories have appeared on Reddit that are similar, and it seems that some people believe the tale. That is terrifying. I would contact the authorities right away. Wish you the best and please keep us posted, writes one person. After reading a wicked tale of a mystery box. We can only congratulate the writer of the post and hope that he or she has a great career in fiction writing. Are we being too skeptical? We don't think we are, but that doesn't mean that some of these videos are well made, well acted, or well told. We agree with this person writing on Quora. The whole idea behind the mystery box is a scam. I've watched many videos on YouTube about mystery boxes, but later come to the conclusion that no sane human being will be willing to buy a piece of garbage. That's not to say that you can't can't buy a mystery box on the dark web. We haven't ordered one at the infographics show, so we can't say for sure. We can, however, go on videos and research and conclude that people are unboxing to create an audience. It's a show, nothing more and nothing less. Sure, you can find media mostly of the tabloid ilk all over the world talking about YouTubers opening these sinister boxes, videos guaranteed to freak you out, 100% genuine, and that you won't believe are real. But those media are just getting on the bandwagon and generating their own audience. Audience. You might also accuse us of doing this, but at least we're trying to give you an informed piece of entertainment. We're calling these videos out as fake, but at least well-made videos for the most part. This isn't to say, of course, that you can't find white powder often grown in Colombia on the dark web. It doesn't mean you wouldn't find that in one of these mystery boxes. One very real journalist writing for the independent newspaper did explore the dark web and did buy illegal things, but when he talked about mystery boxes, he was too skeptical. There were dozens of videos with millions of views, yet there was something that didn't seem quite right about them, he said. The contents of the boxes seemed to fit the stereotypes of the dark web so much that it seemed staged. What did he do? Well, he tried to order a mystery box, of course. Finding one wasn't that easy, and he had to do a lot of searching. He writes that he finally found one trusted vendor willing to sell him a mystery box. He not only sees that others that had bought such a box gave them a thumbs down, but the seller wanted around $1,500 for the box he wanted. That's a bit out of the price range for a journalist, so he asked the advice of someone who has written two books about the dark web and has spent years going through it to see what she could find. Her name is Eileen Ormsby, and a quick search will show you that she is certainly an expert on the dark web. This is what she said to the journalists. Mystery boxes are just silly. The ones on YouTube are primarily total hoaxes invented by the YouTubers themselves for the clicks. She did add, though, that now such boxes are popular, no doubt someone is taking advantage of that and selling them. But they're just full of junk. They don't contain murder weapons or possessed dolls. It's all just a great big hoax, as we said. During her investigations into the dark web that lasted years, she failed to find many of the gruesome things that supposedly exist in this place. While arrests have been made of people doing horrid things in the dark web, it's not something all over the dark web as we're sometimes led to believe. As for mystery boxes, the only mystery to us is how some people believe these videos are real. As you've seen, mystery boxes are really nothing more than a scam. A man is sitting in a room late at night, his face illuminated by the screen of his computer. He's on the dark web and has found the website he's looking for. On the home page it says, if you want to kill someone, we are the right guys. We have professional hitmen available throughout the entire USA, Canada, and Europe, and you can hire a contract killer easily. Great, he thinks, these are the people I'm looking for. That website existed, it was called Besa Mafia, and indeed it said it could send hitmen all over the world to take someone out. 
All you had to do was hand over some Bitcoin and the person you wanted to take care of would soon die. This is a fantastically complex tale. It involves the FBI, it involves hackers, it involves oh. someone saying they're the Albanian Mafia, and it involves murder, a real-life murder. The man we introduced had downloaded the Tor browser and found his way to the dark web after hearing about Hitman for Hire websites. When on the site, he used the name Dog Day God and he asked the admin to do a job for him. That was to kill a woman in the US named Amy Allwine. He told them to make it look like a car accident. He was informed this would cost him $6,000. The woman did end up dead, make no mistake, but her death didn't look like a car accident. Dog Day God told the Bessa Mafia that this woman would be driving in Moline, Illinois in March. The year was 2016, but some time had passed and she was still alive. The Mafia guys said one of their US-based hitmen had gotten into some trouble so things wouldn't go as planned. They said the job could still be done, but with the added complications there would be an added cost, another $12,000 on top of the $6,000. Now getting someone whacked was becoming very costly, but hey, it was better than asking someone on the street. Then something happened that really set Dog Day God back. The Bessa Mafia website was hacked, we'll come back to that. Thanks to investigations, we know that Dog Day God went on to another dark web marketplace and bought the drug scopolamine. It's been used as a truth serum in the past, nicknamed the Devil's Breath, because it can apparently zombify people when taken in large doses. The zombie stories might be somewhat exaggerated, but as one professor told The Guardian, certainly high doses would be completely incapacitating. Anyway, Anyway, this guy wanted some, likely thinking he could do a lot of damage with it. But now back to the victim of the story, Amy Allwine. She might not have been killed immediately, but she did start receiving scary messages from people she didn't know. They threatened her, told her that if she didn't do such and such, her life would slowly be ruined. They would ensure she lost everything. She'd be better off dead. Then one day she felt pretty ill. She even started googling vertigo. It was as if she'd taken some awful drug, an incapacitating drug. It would later turn out that she'd unknowingly taken a very high dose of scopolamine. That that's what the coroner said. But it wasn't the drug that killed her, it was a gunshot wound. Ok, you're confused. That's understandable. Who had killed Amy? The Mafia guys? Or the guy who tried to hire them but later bought a load of the devil's breath? It wasn't the Mafia guys and their hitmen, it was Dog Day God. Turns out he was her husband, Stephen Allwine. Stephen had contacted Bessa Mafia, but things hadn't turned out well after spending thousands of dollars and he bought that drug. He'd obviously given it to her but shot her later and tried to make it look like it wasn't murder. Stephen was apparently a man of God, being a deacon and an elder in his local church. He was also a cheat. The judge called him an incredible actor, a hypocrite, and a cold and calculating killer. He now teaches Bible classes in prison. The important thing here is the fact that the website Bessa Mafia was hacked. The FBI had taken a look at the messages sent to the website and they would seen some from Dog Day God, someone who would paid for a hit on Amy. Cops went round to the couple's house right after the hack and told them about the contract on her life, although at that point they didn't know that Stephen was Dog Day God. He was a suspect though, as nearest and dearest obviously would would be in such a situation. Still, the cops just said remain vigilant and install good security around the house. It wasn't until she died and the cops looked into Steven's computers and his bitcoin wallet that they discovered he was dog day god. Ok, so now we have the part of the story taken care of, but what about these Albanian mafia guys and what about their connection with the FBI? Now another story. We have to go over to London, UK and talk about a man named Chris Montiero. In 2016, at the time all this was going on, he was working as a computer systems administrator, but when he got got home at night, he transformed. He became a kind of mythbuster. Sometimes he just wrote stuff for Wikipedia, but one of his missions in life was to look into urban legends. One such legend that took his fancy was being able to hire a hitman on the dark web. He didn't believe this actually happened and just thought some bad people were getting scammed by other bad people. If you've ever read on the web that internet assassinations are just a myth and you can't hire a killer on the dark web, the information might have come from him. The man did his research too. But then one day someone tried to change what he'd said on the rational Wikipedia website saying you can actually hire a hitman, but the only real website for doing it is Bessa Mafia. The edit read, the site protects the customers with an escrow service that stores the bitcoin until the job is completed. Ah, thought Montiero, this is obviously just the work of the scammers. They can't make money if someone has outed them. Rational Wiki deleted the edit, but then things got really weird to say the least. Montiero then went onto the Bessa Mafia website and wrote a review, and in no uncertain terms he called it a massive scam. A few days later he got a message back, it read, Hello, Hello, I'm one of the admins of the Bessa Mafia website on the deep web. Would it be possible for us to pay for a true and honest positive review? Let me know if we can prove to you that we are legit. It was signed by someone named Yara. Later Montiero received another message. It read, We are open to suggestions. We will do our best to make it the best marketplace focusing on body harm revenge and property destruction. But get this, Yara told Montiero to put his money where his mouth was. He said, If you don't believe we're real, pay us some cash and wait. The person you've chosen for us to beat up will be beaten up. Damn, thought Montiero. 
Piero. Then, after some more back and forth, he received a video clip. It showed someone holding up a piece of paper that read, Gang member for Bessa Mafia on Deep Web. Then, the person blew up a car. No kidding, it was real. He later said, I started questioning myself. Had I bleeped off a criminal organization? What the bleep had I gotten myself into? Still, before you get too excited, with the help of British cops, now he thought he had to go to them, the Firestarter was tracked back to California. It seems this person wasn't Bessa Mafia at all, but some dude in California that just wanted to get involved. Montiero didn't give up there. He created an account with the Bessa Mafia website saying his name was Bodie McBoatface. He wrote to the admin stating that he wanted someone taken out. That man was none other than Bob the Builder. If you don't know, this is a children's TV character in the UK. Montiero was a smart guy, is a smart guy. He's not been whacked as of the time of writing. But communicating with the website, he managed to exploit a vulnerability that made it possible for him to download all of Bessa Mafia's message database. It had all the names of the people that had contacted it. What a massive pot of gold he had just found. He subsequently reported what he'd seen online, saying the site was a scam. No one actually ever died, he said, although people did pay for that to be done. People from all over the world had written to Bessa Mafia and said they wanted someone to be taken out. We don't need to tell you that such information is pretty useful to law enforcement. The messages seem to show the same thing quite often. Ura could do the job, but things usually went wrong, and that would involve more costs like what happened to Dog Day God. Some people asked for a refund when the job was never done, others just gave up, and Yura became a fairly wealthy man, for an internet scammer at least. Yura might have also been a woman, that's up for debate. It turned out that the one guy that had written to Yura saying he wanted to become a hired assassin, the message read, I am broke, of course, I am looking for quick cash, I have military training, US Navy. Yura said he wasn't hiring at the moment, but asked if the guy could do something else in the meantime. That was to make a video of himself blowing up a car. This was the car video sent to Montiero. But then Yura said, can you also get yourself a fake gun and start acting out fake murders. Guess what? Videos on the web surfaced of such things. This was all part of Yura's plan to make Bessa Mafia look like the real deal. You can't blame Yura for his effort. He even went as far to hire SEO experts to ensure Bessa Mafia ranked high in searches. While this is all very amusing, you have to remember that there is a very serious aspect to what went on. People were trying to hire hitmen to kill people. As Montiero told Wired Magazine, maybe Yura was just a scammer, but the clients in this case were some really bad people. The messages at times were from trolls, as could be expected, but most of them were legitimate. One guy said he wanted his wife's secret lover killed. He said he'd donate his own organs if he could get a discount. He then asked, once the hit was done, could his wife be smuggled into Saudi Arabia? Another person from the Netherlands asked for a guy to be mowed down on his bicycle. He gave details about where the guy cycled. This was serious stuff. In the meantime, Yura tried to assure people reading his website that he was not a scammer and things were going fine. He wrote, we are not a scam. There are no Bitcoin lost. Our website got hacked, but hackers only got information about some users. Those messages showed many details. Some users didn't ask for someone to be killed, but merely beaten up. Others asked for someone to be mutilated, but some went the whole way. Murder usually cost anywhere between $5,000 and $200,000, but there were additional costs for making it look like an accident. Having someone beat up was just $500 and setting a car on fire was $1,000. While Montiero had told people this was all a big scam, many folks out there believed it was real. Someone wrote on the website, I saw they also have hitmen who do murder for hire, and was astonished to see that the price was very low, only $5,000. In a thread on Quora, other so-called experts said Bessa Mafia was 100% legit. By this time, Montiero was showing British cops what he had found. He showed them one message from a guy named Dog Day God. The message showed he told Euro that he first said, please kill her and make it look like a hit and run. Then he said, well, a traffic collision while she's driving would do just fine. When he got more desperate, he said, just do it any way you want. Shoot her if necessary or burn the house down. The same house where he read his Bible. One message he sent read, I need this bleep dead so please help me. You know the rest. He murdered her himself. As for how Montiero felt about that, he later said, I've been thinking, well, these are horrible, terrible people who, if you don't arrest them, maybe will take matters into their own hands. I thought that was hypothetical, but then it really happened. Now things get more messed up. Montiero, who we've so far painted as the hero of this story, had a visit from the UK police. He was sitting at home one night, getting ready to eat his soup, when they used a battering ram to burst through his front door. They took his computers and shoved him into a police van. At the police station, he was told he was wanted in relation to a murder and his connection with the organized crime group, the Bessa Mafia. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Hadn't he told everyone they were fake? Let's say again here that Euro was also a very smart dude. He'd spent months creating a misinformation campaign to make it look as though Montiero was part of the assassination plots. He created email addresses with the name Chris Montiero and he got his freelancers to start working on the campaign. It worked. Obviously, the warrant for Montiero's arrest read, open source reporting shows that Chris Montiero and two other subjects created the hitman for hire website Bessa Mafia on the dark web. Montiero was, to say the least, going crazy as he sat in his
his cell, at times reading the only available book, a golf autobiography. He'd been outsmarted, he'd been done, and Yura must have been laughing his head off from the comfort of his own home, wherever that was. British investigators said Montiero was part of everything, an ally, while he told them he was just the opposite. He was a man that had tried to show Yura was a scammer and also the man that had helped solve a murder. Without laughing, he told investigators he was Bodie McBoatface and he tried to take out Bob the Builder, but only as a means to uncover the truth about the Mesa Mafia. Detectives didn't believe him. One of them asked him if he was so innocent, why did he have a copy of the computer game Hitman in his apartment? But after two days of interrogations and an inspection of all the data on all his computers, mm -hmm. the cops let him go. The UK's National Crime Agency, however, made some arrests based on conspiracy to kill charges. It turned out a British doctor had contacted Bessa Mafia and asked for a financial advisor to be killed. A woman in Denmark was arrested for asking the website to kill her former boyfriend. Bessa Mafia was shut down and Montiero just gave up on Yura. Then he received an email from him about six months later. Yura told Montiero that at the end of the day, exposing him as a scammer had only served to make people actually look into real ways of killing someone. Sure, he said, Bessa Mafia while a scam was better than nothing. Then Yura started another website, Cosa Nostra. Would this ever end? And how come he hadn't been arrested? Montiero hacked Yura again, and this led to more arrests, one as far as Singapore. But how had Yura managed to start up operations again and evade the law? Yura had actually started a bunch of other Hitman websites. Some of them were Sicilian Hitman, Nadrangheta Hitman, Camorra Hitman, Bratva Mafia, and Yakuza Mafia. They were all the same websites under different names. For instance, one of them read on the homepage, the Bratva Mafia is the proven, legitimate deep web eBay of crime. We offer you a large international network of experienced hitmen and provide services to beat up, set fire, or kill customers' targets. We assign hitmen in the same country as the target with the appropriate skills that match the job specifications. Montero did his stuff and yet again he told the National Crime Agency, or the NCA, about all these people writing to Yura asking for someone to be killed. The NCA emailed back one day and said, we aren't monitoring that website, then there have been no arrests. However, we work closely with our international law enforcement parties to share information and intelligence. He was virtually ignored, even though he was sitting on information that could save someone's life. He later said he couldn't stop because there were people's lives at risk. But who was, is, Yura? And what about his connection with the FBI? As we said, Yura has avowed that he is doing good in the world. People that have contacted him have been told that his scamming exposes folks who want someone killed. He wrote to Wired saying, it's a moral right to scam criminals and would-be murderers if it helps saving victims. He also wrote, after Bessa Mafia was hacked, FBI agents talked with me on a chat site. He told me they don't want to arrest me, they're not after me, they want to arrest the murderers. So, is he an informant, or at least did he become an informant? The FBI, of course, won't say if Yura is working for them, but think about it, it would make sense. Law enforcement has always allowed criminals to profit if their criminal informants give them the information they need. But the fact is, by telling folks you can take someone out for them just might lead them to do it themselves once they've been ripped off. It's planting seeds in people's minds, not something the FBI I would want. Still, it is very likely that the FBI is letting Yura get away with scamming. Perhaps they think it's worth the risk. In fact, if you go through all the personal messages that were leaked, you can see some of them show administrators of the site telling someone that they help law enforcement. One time, the admin was contacted about a possible hit on a woman in Texas. The admin gave the investigator all the information he needed and said he would help with the other investigations if need be. He said he would help the FBI when possible. Remember, these were hacked messages, not something the FBI would want out there. It's likely why the National Crime Agency in the UK basically ignored Montiero because they were already talking to Yura. One hacked message said this, Hello, yes, that is correct. We receive orders to kill people from all over the world. However, our site is fake and we don't have any hitmen. We forward the orders to police departments where the targets are located. Still, the years passed and those websites stayed up and many people asked to have someone killed. One of the latest arrests involved a woman in Illinois who asked for the wife of a man she was in love with to be murdered. She got 12 years in prison for that. An official press release read, Thankfully, the intended victim, whom the defendant deemed a romantic rival, was unharmed even though Jones carefully planned the murder and paid more than $12,000 in Bitcoin to the Sicilian Hitman International Network to carry out the murder. So, are there really any legitimate sites out there where you can hire a killer? Some of them right now state they are the real thing. One of them says we can provide video proof of our services with timestamps. Again, such proof is not possible for fake services. If you try and find solid proof when a Hitman actually was hired on the dark web and did actually go through with the job, you can find just one instance. It happened in 2018, when Russian teenagers were hired by a drug trafficker to gun down a police officer. That one story, though, will likely only serve to make a lot of money for the fake hitmen. Guys only too willing to pass on your details to law enforcement. A man looks at his computer monitor, where messages flash up from somewhere in the dark web. He's told he'll need to be screened. 
Don't feel bad, says the next message. We do this for everyone. They tell him the small invasion of privacy is worth it. The hacking software they're about to sell him is expensive, but for anything he gets under 500,000 US dollars, they only want 25%. If it's over 5 million, they only want 10%. It's the sale of the century, the mystery person types. This is all based on a true story. The hacker the guy is talking to is part of the dark side group. They provide what's called ransomware as a service, meaning they sell people ransomware so they can target someone with a lot of money. This could potentially ruin them. Their data is held for ransom, and then comes the extortion part. The dark side hackers claim to be Robin Hood characters. Their ransomware is designed to extort companies or governments, but they won't let people hit a nonprofit, a school, or any kind of health service. The targets might also be wealthy people, who usually have a lot to lose. Imagine if a billionaire such as Bill Gates had a deep, dark secret. Imagine the secret became known to the public. How much would Gates be willing to pay to suppress that information? Or how much would you be willing to pay? Because whether you're a billionaire or not, there's a good chance your information is already out there on the dark web, which is why I'm so excited to partner with the sponsor of today's video, Aura. I decided to try out Aura for myself and I was absolutely shocked at what it found. My data, tons of it, was out there on the web just waiting to be used for who knows what. I shouldn't be surprised, after all, identity theft is the fastest growing crime in America with a new victim every 14 seconds. That's why I started using Aura. Aura is identity theft protection and fraud monitoring with near real-time alerts, a VPN to keep you anonymous and your data encrypted, and antivirus software all in one easy-to-use app. They even work to get any of your data that's already out there erased from the web, which has actually reduced the amount of spam and robocalls I receive. There's a good chance you have one or maybe even a couple of these services already, but so did I, and you can see what good it did in protecting my info from getting out there. It was like I had locked my front door but left the back wide open. With Aura, you have all the tools to remain protected no matter what the hackers on the dark web try. So start protecting yourself and your family from identity theft right now by going to Aura.com slash infographics. If you sign up using my link, Aura will give you a free two-week trial so you can see for yourself how many times Aura finds your personal info on the dark web. Darkseid isn't showing off when they say they only want 10% of anything over $5 million. $5 million isn't unheard of in the world of ransomware attacks. You could potentially bring down a company like Apple with such an attack, certainly if you've managed to lock the company out of its own files and you're threatening to delete them. Darkseid is still around. In 2021, they targeted an oil pipeline company in the US called Colonial Pipeline. They took control of the operations, which was devastating for the company. About 45% of all the fuel used on the East Coast goes through this pipeline. The hacker said, give us 75 Bitcoin or 4.4 million and we'll give you your system back. They were paid within a few hours. Hackers often ask for cryptocurrency because it's harder to trace, especially if the hackers have taken extra precautions and anonymized the exchange. In some cases, they might even have hacked someone's bank account. So the money goes into it and then comes out without the person knowing. Although this is tricky, it might be much easier in certain countries where banks don't monitor payments so strictly. Back to the pipeline hack. The company later said it was the right thing to do for the country. It's thought Darkseid was able to do the hack because it bought a very important password on the dark web. Darkseid said they were after cash and didn't want to create chaos. Just pay up and everything will be okay, they said. They hit around 90 companies so far, most of which are in the US. They even get into the files of the companies so they know the companies are able to pay the ransom. It's no use saying you're broke when your accounts have been seen. The US has had enough. The government has now put a $10 million bounty on these hackers' heads. But will they be caught? We'll get around to that later. It's thought the dark side hackers are located somewhere in Eastern Europe, maybe Russia. The group might be made up of people not only from Eastern Europe but also from China, North Korea, Iran, and Syria. They certainly make spelling mistakes when writing messages. They like to do that. After the pipeline hack, they released a statement saying, our goal is to make money not creating problems for society. You might now be thinking, released in a statement? If they can release statements, surely they can be found. The news agency Reuters even sent messages to Darkseid's website. If that's possible, surely they can't remain hidden for long. The short answer is, they can, they might, or perhaps they will. They're not alone in doing what they do. The BBC recently reported that Russian authorities had arrested hackers in Russia who went by the name of R Evil. They also used ransomware to extort large amounts of money. When they were arrested, the Russian cops found over $4 million in cash and about 440000 in Bitcoin. They also seized 20 premium cars. It's said the gang was prolific, in some cases involving rich people, perhaps the police were never even called. In some attacks, the authorities were not even contacted. After all, if Bill Gates did have a deep dark secret, he wouldn't exactly want it to be known to everyone. 
That's the beauty of hacking scoundrels. We're not saying Gates is, we're just using him as an example because conspiracy theorists think he's up to no good. But if you do hack a real scoundrel like robbing a drug dealer, the cops are usually not brought in. Perfect. Game, set, and match. Hackers. It could even happen to you if you had enough cash to attract hackers. One day you might wake up to discover you're locked out of all your devices. You might just think you have some kind of hardware problem. Then your computer might flash up the words, you've been hacked. This is exactly what happened recently to a man in Australia. His computers went down and then the message flashed up. Oh, Jesus, he thought. In his case, the hackers wanted 15 million. They got into his systems and encrypted everything, meaning they owned the key to all his data. They said, if you pay us, we'll give you the encryption key and be gone straight away. This guy had security too, but obviously not enough. This kind of cyber criminality is now a huge global issue. People and companies pay millions in ransom these days. The gangs of lore have moved on from the bloody streets. Cybercrime is a damn sight easier than the old school kidnapping of a rich person's daughter. No one gets hurt these days, physically at least. No thumbs and pinky fingers need be sent through the post. The crimes are bloodless, but such financial crimes are what governments hate the most. Kill a neighbor? Sure, get 10 years. Steal from a bank or corporation? Expect to be burned on the proverbial stake. What's even more disturbing is within this fairly new criminal enterprise, as we said, there is ransomware as a service. Anyone wandering around the dark web is a potential hacker, just imagine it. Some kid is looking to invest some money and instead of gambling on the stock market or betting on housing prices to go up, he can earn a cool few hundred thousand from buying some ransomware from a complete stranger. We're sure you all know what the dark web is. If not, we're about to explain the concept. You have the web you're using right now, which is the regular internet. Then you have the deep web, which are networks such as what you might use at work. You can't just log on to other networks, they're private. Your email is private, no one can search for it, it's hidden deep, man. And then there's the dark web. This can only be accessed with certain browsers such as the Tor browser. It uses something called onion routing. We won't go into all the technical stuff today, all you need to know is that the onion is called that because it has layers. That means the user can't be found. Their data is anonymized, which means removing all the identifying information. In the dark web, you're a ghost. That's why people go on the dark web and don't feel too concerned about buying a kilogram of Columbia's finest or a bucket full of ecstasy pills. It should be said, in terms of drugs, some of the largest sellers have been caught in the past. While the dark web provides a certain amount of anonymity, if the FBI or another similar authority wants you, well, they can sometimes find you. How? Well, they don't always say, but in the game of hide and seek, it seems they sometimes cheat. Still ask any Brit who's addicted to drugs where he gets his gear these days, he might have been given a contact form on the dark web. He then uses encrypted messaging to contact the dealer, a dealer who could virtually be anywhere. He then asks for some drugs, maybe a gram or ten of brown, heroin, and it's delivered in the post, hidden really well in the package. This is the modern world. This is why crime these days is often the cyber kind. The gangs have evolved, or in the parlance of the great TV show The Wire, they've changed up their game. The ransomware folks work on a different level. These people really know how to hide. It's said that these days they're all over the dark web, that the ransomware business is thriving. The hacking gig is booming right now because hackers are smarter than ever regarding not getting caught. If you don't believe us, listen to this. In 2022, a criminal intelligence group known as Forensic Pathways took a good look around the dark web using dark search engines. They evaluated close to 35 million dark web URLs, which included various markets and forums. They found ransomware products and services, which in total numbered 475 web pages. The media reported that many of them were aggressively promoting ransomware as a service. No ransomware was exactly the same, but the upshot is they all held data for ransom so someone could extort money. You might have heard of WannaCry. This was one of the ransomware packages for sale. Not long ago, it got into a huge number of machines in 150 countries. It caused mayhem for Britain's National Health Service, which, let's face it, was not cool at all. It said there were 623 million ransomware attacks in 2021. No exact figure was given for the losses, but one security firm said the average cost of an attack on a big business is $1.4 million. Attacks on regular people are much less bountiful, but might feel like a lot to the victim. If you're going to be a criminal, this is a great business to be in. A global cybersecurity firm called Black Frog wrote on its website in 2021, with damages from cybercrime expected to hit $6 trillion this year, up from $3 trillion in 2015, we expect the number of ransomware attacks to increase and newer forms to become more sophisticated and disruptive. $3 trillion sounds like a lot. Other sources say it might be between $600 billion and $1 trillion. It's still a hefty figure. That just boggles the mind. We know some of you infographics fans out there are thinking right now, hmm, this sounds like something I could get into. Well, just remember that prison sentences for cybercriminals are about as harsh as they come. 
If your country has the death penalty, you won't get that, although you could in Pakistan. Still, receiving a life sentence is not unusual at all. You're probably now thinking, how come if so many people are selling this stuff, there haven't been more arrests? Well, you already know that your data is anonymized when you go onto the dark web. Like the guy in the intro, you could be looking at the ransomware catalog of some website and you wouldn't know a thing about the people behind it. Not where they live, not where the computers are, and it goes without saying that the people on the dark web don't generally sign off with their own name. That's where forensics comes in. Forensics is basically the science of trying to figure out who the criminals are. So with the dark web, forensic officers will try to link the messages or websites to the actual people. You already know that it's hard since the dark side crew is still in business, but you know it's not impossible because the Russian are evil guys are locked up. Still, they're incredibly hard to track down. They're hidden not just with the Tor browser but hidden behind many more layers. You all know what a VPN is, a virtual private network, because that's how you watch stuff on the BBC iPlayer when you're not in Britain, or at least um, that's how some people do it. But when you're using a VPN, your data is encrypted and then rerouted to another server. In the BBC iPlayer case, the server is in Britain, so the BBC website thinks that's where you are. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, as the Brits might say. You also could use a proxy server which will reroute your connection via a third party so the website you hit won't have your personal data. This is why the FBI often says things like, we think the attackers might be somewhere in Russia or some part of Eastern Europe. They might know that not just from following digital tracks but from some other forensic evidence regarding names, language, etc. Just like when the cops are looking for serial killers, criminal profilers can also draw up profiles for hackers. If they're clever, they don't leave a digital footprint at all. Not just when they're selling ransomware on the dark web but also when they're manually executing an attack. Maybe the guy who bought that ransomware at the start of the show wasn't just using Tor and a VPN when he talked to the criminals but he later protected himself when he attacked his victim. He was in and out and gone and it was as if he'd never been there. Reminds us of some of the dialogue in the movie The Usual Suspects. That was his power. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist and like that, poof, he's gone. The greatest trick a hacker ever played was convincing his victim he didn't exist. And as we've shown you, it doesn't take a genius to hide. The genius part is writing the program that performs the attack, which brings us to something else. Hackers might also hijack something called an RDP session. If you don't know already, sometimes you might have an issue with your computer, so you have to allow someone to get onto your computer remotely. Sometimes with Microsoft, the folks who start using your computer are as far away as India. When someone does this for the first time, watching them open and close files from halfway across the world while you're sitting there feeling exposed can be unnerving. It's like that office management training activity where you have to trust people to catch you when you fall backward. In the end, he tells you the session is done, you get the message that the session is over, relief, you can go to bed. But what if someone can unlock a locked, closed session while you're fast asleep? It's happened in the past. Think about it, if the guy in India can take over your computer, surely there are ways for hackers to do the same. In other cases of hacking, it might be possible to hack a website and use its server from which to launch an attack. Pure, unadulterated anonymity. With ransomware, they might get information by sending you a dodgy file. It's a virus, it's malicious, but you, you can't resist opening things. It might come from anywhere. A video file might say, OMG, watch this, it's crazy. And you, well, OMG always gets you. When you open the file, you impetuous fool, a malicious software gets into your machine. It might wait until your computer is dormant to infect your drives, shared drives, servers, attached computers, and other systems. This is why you should never open a file without knowing what it is, even if it seems that a buddy just sent it to you through email or a messenger. The hackers have just hacked his email or gotten access to his messenger. It happens all the time. Some people will do stuff like answer a question on a Facebook page which asks them what their dog's name was when they were a kid. Sometimes they're just harmless ways to promote companies, but sometimes hackers can use that information. It's called phishing. Stay well away from putting anything personal online, especially when you don't even know who you're communicating with. So don't open mystery files. If they're sent by a friend, contact him or her and ask if they've sent it. And don't go talking about yourself in comment boxes of groups you don't know on Facebook. Obviously, big companies and people like Bill Gates have amazing security, but humans are humans, and they sometimes make errors. You can have the best security in the world and a staff member who puts his pet's name on Facebook. In that pipeline attack, it's thought the hackers got a VPN password from one of the staff. As we told you, it's very hard to catch hackers, but as you know, it does happen. Take for instance, a guy named Eric Own Marquez. He was offering hosting capabilities on the dark web for a long time. He hosted websites for drugs, hacking, and money laundering and websites where people posted lots and lots of illegal images. So, how did they break his anonymity? 
It's not exactly known because the FBI, it seems, didn't want to talk about it. Marquez himself said he thought it was the hackers who worked for NASA. Remember, many hackers end up working for the other team. If you can beat them, join them and ask for lots of money. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, a civil liberties group, said, It does a disservice to our criminal justice system when the government hides techniques of investigation from public and criminal defendants. They accuse the government of using illegal methods to catch Marquez. You might think, well, that seems fair. But as we know from Edward Snowden, the government can sometimes be blamed for using tentacles to go places they have no right to go. Nonetheless, cybercrime is getting out of hand. It's thought the government these days manages to arrest only about 5% of the criminals. Maybe crime does pay. Ask any old-school gangster or a common drug dealer about the chances of getting caught. They'll tell you that in the end, everyone gets caught. Or they die. It's one or the other. But that's not always the case with cybercrime. Obviously, this highly unethical way of living is still dangerous, and as we said earlier, if you're caught, you can kiss goodbye the rest of your life. The US government says it will find you, never mind where you're hiding out in the world. The Justice Department proudly announced in 2021, our message to ransomware criminals is clear. If you target victims here, we will target you. Identity theft, corporate secrets, free speech activists, murder. The dark web is lurking right under your nose, and you'll be amazed about the things found there that the government doesn't want you to know about. But what is the dark web? Most of you filthy casuals spend your whole lives on the internet where you can get access to about 1.7 billion websites with a simple .com address. If you were to try to browse every single website, it would probably take several lifetimes. But these websites only account for about 7-10% to of the total internet. The surface web, as it's known to anyone who's actually cool, is where you've lived your entire digital life, likely completely unaware you were standing on the tip of a very, very large iceberg. Normal websites are accessible either directly with a .com address or through a search engine. When you Google something like Babylon 5 versus Battlestar Galactica, who would win? A search engine crawls through the millions upon millions of websites to find related results which get indexed for future reference and then provided to you on your computer screen. However, directly beneath the World Wide Web are what basically are huge repositories of information which you can't normally navigate directly yourself. Think of it like a massive basement for storage. This is known as the deep web. Underneath that, you have the dark web, which is basically a wild west of internet. This is the place a normal browser can't access, and while it exists alongside the normal web, it requires special tools to access, and often pre-existing knowledge of how to navigate to the specific content you're looking for. While dark web search engines exist, you're not going to find the vast majority of what lurks below without a direct invitation. So, what kind of things can you find lurking in the murkiest depths of the internet? The answer might surprise you. The first and most popular illegal item on the dark web is, by a stretch, drugs. The dark web is one of the best options for buying drugs available to users today. You can find almost any illegal substance your heart desires on the dark web, all deliverable right to your door. But how does it work? Surprisingly easy. First, you navigate to your favorite dark web drug marketplace. There used to be either Alpha Bay or Silk Road, though both have been shut down. Once on the marketplace, of your choice, you simply browse no different than you would browse Amazon. You go to your search bar, type in your preferred drug of choice, then simply scroll down to see all the listings available. And there are thousands upon thousands of listings to choose from. Drugs on the dark web are in no short supply. In order to set your mind at ease, sellers are often rated by customers no different than Amazon. The product itself is often rated as well. And in some sites, users can even leave reviews. In essence, it's simple internet economics at work. And the same things that matter on legitimate online marketplaces, product and seller reviews, matter matter here too. So, you can be sure that a seller is going to work extra hard to make their customers happy, and this makes online marketplaces a dramatic improvement over buying drugs from a local street dealer. A street dealer might get your product faster with less hoops to jump through, but they are far less bothered by bad reviews. You're also not going to get shot over your computer trying to buy drugs. Once you've made your selection, checking out is just like Amazon, only instead of using a credit card or PayPal, you pay with cryptocurrency. Typically, this is going to be Bitcoin, but most marketplaces accept different currencies. Now, now you enter your mailing address and wait for your package to arrive. Thanks to the encryption during the entire checkout process, it's almost impossible for authorities to track buyer and seller, and cryptocurrency leaves practically no money trail to follow. For a buyer, the only real point of risk is on receipt of the drugs, but it's not illegal to receive drugs over the mail, and a buyer could simply feign ignorance if caught. Authorities must prove that the drugs were intentionally bought, and that is extremely difficult. For sellers, the benefits of selling drugs online over the streets are a hundredfold. First, there's that added safety of working remotely. An online seller doesn't
doesn't have to worry about getting hustled out on the street, having their cash and stash stolen, or being muscled out by rival sellers. The darknet has completely eliminated violence from the equation. The fact that vendor and buyer never actually meet also protects the seller, as the buyer has no way to inform on the seller if caught by police and pressured into acting as an informant. But how legit are the online drugs? You'd be surprised at how few scams are run on the darknet. While there is some risk, sellers live and die by their reputation, and a new seller is going to have a very difficult time establishing themselves enough to be trusted. Think about when you've browsed eBay or Amazon. Were you more likely to buy a product from a vendor with hundreds of sales and a good rating, or a brand new vendor with a few sales and no reviews? A seller could scam customers, but they'd then have to create a new identity with zero reviews and zero ratings, making it incredibly inefficient to run a scam on the dark web. Purity is also surprisingly standard between online and offline drugs, despite there being a greater potential for cheating customers thanks to the darknet's anonymity. In a study conducted in the Netherlands, researchers found that drugs bought online and those bought offline measured almost equally in purity. In fact, the online drugs were slightly more pure than those sold on the streets. Other studies have varied, with some finding lower quality. Suppose it probably matters who you're buying from, as many of you who have bought from Wish versus Amazon have discovered. And the best part about online drug marketplaces is that, like normal marketplaces, they ship globally. But some customers on the dark web aren't interested in drugs, they're more interested in violence. To that end, the dark web has become a huge marketplace for weapons, though selection is still limited. If you're looking to pick up some extra firepower on the dark web, you're basically limited to what can be physically shipped to you in discrete packaging, so you're not likely to find much in the way of heavy explosives or large caliber weapons, though there are always exceptions to the rules depending on where you live and how lax your government is about postal inspection. Pistols are the most commonly listed item on dark web marketplaces, making up nearly 84% of listings discovered in a RAND Europe and University of Manchester study. Next were rifles, making up 10% of listings, and finally submachine guns at 6%. Of all firearm-related products, actual firearms made up 42% of the listings, with arms-related digital products such as manuals showing how to modify existing firearms making up the 27%, and finally things like ammunition and accessories making up 22% of listings. The other 4% was not elaborated on by the study, or maybe the researchers are just bad at math. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the majority of these firearms all originated from the United States, which made up a whopping 60% of listings. Next was European countries making up a quarter of listings, and the rest were from unspecified locations of origin. If you're a purchaser worried about quality, then fret not, as weapons available on the dark web were discovered to be of the same quality as store or street bought weapons, and often available either cheaper or at the same price as one would pay at a physical vendor. Despite fears though, the dark web is actually not a significant source of firearms, as sales of dark web guns are estimated at only around 80,000 a month, or about 136 firearms. Given the greater difficulty in procuring and shipping firearms, this is perhaps unsurprising. You're also not going to find large enough quantities of weapons on the dark web to stage an uprising against your local government. The logistical challenges of shipping weapons to a customer makes it impossible to send large amounts of weapons around the world, and also limits the types of weapons available for purchase. But what if you don't want to commit the violence yourself? Can you really hire a hitman on the dark web? In February 2020, an anonymous a scammer tipped off the FBI about a murder-for-hire plot. It seems that this particular scammer might have been happy ripping people off, but murder was a line too far for him or her. What they revealed to authorities was chilling. The scammer was providing the address and name of the target to be eliminated, a woman working in Bellevue, Washington. The chilling message read, Just kill her ASAP. I don't care how, just make sure she's dead. I'd prefer you shoot her in the head. She works in, name of corporation, in Bellevue, but I don't know exactly where. I don't know if that helps you in some way. She has a three-year-old son and she picks him up at 5 p.m., so she usually gets home around 5-ish. Please don't do anything to the boy. Send me proof when the job's done. The client sent a payment of 0.53 Bitcoin, worth about $5,000 at the time. The FBI immediately identified the target and discreetly approached her so as to not tip off the client. They interviewed her and asked who would have the occasion to want her dead. She revealed that her husband had had an affair with a woman he had met while at a business conference, and further investigation revealed that he had been giving her money, including a one-time gift of $5,000 that she had asked for. The feds got a search warrant for the woman's email accounts and were able to piece together the fact that she was, in fact, the client. After arrest, she admitted to the deed. Most hitman services on the dark web are a scam, as it's 
since been discovered. But in April of this year, a plot was unraveled in Italy which could have been all too real. Italian citizen Tommaso Girotti was discovered paying $12,000 in cryptocurrency to an intermediary who would hire a hitman on his behalf. While the customer in this case didn't want the target, an ex-girlfriend killed, he did want her disfigured with acid and beaten so badly that she would be wheelchair-bound for the rest of her life. In fact, he insisted on that latter half. How exactly the planned hit was discovered is something authorities are keeping close to their chest, but they were able to not only discover the planned hit, but actually trace the transaction back to the client leading to his arrest. The intermediary and the hitman that was to be hired, however, remain undiscovered, and the planned victim is safe and sound today. It is unknown if this was a legit service or if Girotti was simply being scammed, as is so often the case. Directly tracing actual murders to services being offered on the dark web is very difficult. The general consensus, however, seems to be that the vast majority of hitman for hire services on the dark web are simply scams, and given the fact that most murders are crimes of passion, it's no surprise that this is a relatively easy scam to pull off. For one, we feel absolutely no sympathy for the victims, so if you're out there scamming would-be murderers, keep up the good work. But what you most commonly find on the dark web is something you probably take for granted every day – free speech. The dark web's anonymity makes it the go-to for everyone from dissidents to journalists in free speech hostile countries such as China and Saudi Arabia and any number of dictatorships around the world. Many journalists use the dark web to securely communicate with sources or to share reports out of country to media outlets in the free world. Given that the most popular tool for accessing the dark web, the Tor browser, was created by the United States to allow its spies to communicate securely from anywhere in the world, it's perhaps no surprise that the dark web is now the primary way of smuggling news out of free speech hostile states, or for hosting debates and making plans for political activists in places that would see them arrested or worse in the real world. The dark web was instrumental for pro-democracy activists in evading Chinese censorship and intelligence agencies during the Hong Kong riots that rocked the city for weeks. The dark web is the perfect place to buy just about anything. You can find exotic animals, weapons, and stolen credit cards and identities. But can you buy a nuclear bomb? The dark web is the ultimate black market, a wild zone where anything can be put up for sale anonymously and purchased via hard-to-track cryptocurrency. That means anything is possible. But in order to buy one of the deadliest weapons in history, it takes a chain reaction, going back decades. Nuclear weapons are only in the hands of world powers, and no country makes them legal for private ownership, which would take right to bear arms to a whole new level. So how does one wind up for sale in the first place? In 2015, a French reporter revealed a terrifying tale. He traveled to the Eastern European country of Bulgaria and supposedly met with a man named Ivanov, a former high-ranking official in military intelligence. Ivanov had fallen on hard times since the fall of the Eastern Bloc. He'd gotten in with some bad people. They included Saudi Arabia which had many people interested in weapons of mass destruction. And Bulgaria had them to spare. But Bulgaria isn't a nuclear power, is it? It's a little more complicated than that, and it all comes back to the source of most complicated things in global affairs. The Cold War. Bulgaria was firmly in Soviet sphere during that era and was known as the People's Republic of Bulgaria. While Bulgaria wasn't a rich country during the era, it was strategically significant and that meant that the Soviet Union armed it heavily with short- and long-range missiles. They weren't meant to be launched on their own, but were essentially a fail-safe for the Soviet military, because these conventional weapons were set to go nuclear at a moment's notice. If war broke out, as it almost did several times during the Cold War, the Soviet forces would sweep in and take over the Bulgarian infrastructure. They would equip the ready-made Bulgarian missiles with Soviet nuclear warheads and let loose on their enemies from a front that the Western countries wouldn't see coming. Whether this plan would have worked or not is up for debate. There's a good chance that any U.S.-Soviet war would have been too destructive for any secondary plan like this to work, but Bulgaria was far more heavily armed than one would expect a small nation to be. But soon, these weapons would be a danger of a very different kind. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it set its entire sphere into chaos. Countless countries saw their communist governments collapse and be replaced, and there were years of uncertainty and violence in many of them. And in that chaos, it was very easy for weapons to go missing. Suddenly, everyone's eyes were on Bulgaria's weapons program. What exactly did they have hidden in their military facilities? Their missile programs were well known, and there was no evidence of biological weapons and little of chemical weapons. Their nuclear weapons were a different story. While Bulgaria never developed their own nuclear weapons, they had plenty of nuclear-capable missiles and a treaty that required the Soviet Union to deploy their own weapons in Bulgaria's defense. But the question was, did they have any already stored in the country, and where did they go? No one knew for the first few years, but in the mid-90s, an anonymous Soviet captain spoke up. He revealed a massive nuclear weapons facility in the country hosting 70 missiles. 
It had supposedly been disbanded in 1989 and the weapon shipped to Ukraine, but the question on everyone's mind was if they had all gotten there. And it seems the answer was no. In the chaos of the collapse of an empire, things slip through the cracks and people take advantage. The mysterious Ivanov had apparently stolen a non-armed warhead from a facility and hid it, buried it in the ground near his mother's house. He had made a small fortune for himself with his business dealings in Saudi Arabia, but kept a tight hold on his prized possession. While abroad, he would meet with shady elements involved in global terrorism. Some wanted to get their hands on nuclear material, and one was particularly ambitious. His name was Osama bin Laden. The terror mastermind who would later become infamous worldwide was seeking to make a nuclear bomb out of radioactive waste, a so-called dirty bomb. While it wouldn't carry the full nuclear payload of a warhead, it could contaminate a major American city and render it inhospitable for decades. But Ivanov had no problem brokering deals with the worst elements in the world and offered him a better option. Why not go for the genuine article and purchase a Soviet-era nuke? It was an exchange that could have changed the path of world history. But why didn't bin Laden buy Ivanov's nuke? Perhaps he was worried about being traced and his terror network being destroyed. Maybe he didn't trust that the nuke was still in working order. Maybe they couldn't agree on a price, and Ivanov decided to keep his prized possession in hand. Or maybe Ivanov is fond of tall tales and never actually met the terror mastermind, despite the wild stories he tells to reporters. What is known is that Ivanov claims his personal nuclear bomb is still buried at his mom's house. And there's a reason it stays underground. Nuclear power isn't foolproof, as those in Chernobyl found out the hard way. One minor mistake can release deadly nuclear energy, killing or sickening anyone nearby and contaminating the area for decades. Bombs can degrade and leak as they age, but burying them can neutralize possible exposure, especially if it's buried in a vegetable garden. The vegetables absorb the radiation in small amounts, making it safer to live near where the weapon is buried. But mom might want to get her cabbages from the local market instead. But buried things don't stay buried forever. The nuclear black market is still going strong. Most of it is based around nuclear materials rather than finished weapons. Enriched uranium, which can be used to arm a nuclear bomb, has shown up in several smuggling operations. The smugglers usually get caught, and this material can command a high price, well into the six figures. Police investigations showed that the source of the material was likely a classified military facility in Russia, but they didn't believe that Russia was funneling its own weapons out of the country. Rather, they believed that an insider was using the massive, poorly regulated nuclear cachet in Eastern Europe to turn a profit. But are those black market weapons actually a threat? Yes and no. Someone who winds up with a cache of black market uranium is unlikely to be able to build their own nuclear bomb. An actual nuclear bomb costs millions to build, and the designs are highly classified. While a dirty bomb could be simpler, the odds are an untrained person would be more likely to kill themselves while working with the uranium. But that's where the threat comes in. Even if someone never gets to the point of building a bomb successfully, there's a good chance their failure will release radiation into the surrounding area. That's why federal agents around the world are determined to stop the nuclear black market in its tracks. But so far, results are mixed. Much of the information on the nuclear black market is highly classified, and attempts to find out more from the government will often get reporters quickly ushered out of the room. That's why reporters have gone to great extremes, including heading to Bulgaria personally to meet with nuke peddlers. The first was a French reporter who claimed to have gotten all the way to Ivanov's mother's garden to purchase the nuke. But reports vary, and many say that the French reporter actually purchased a Bulgarian nuclear-capable warhead rather than an equipped nuclear weapon. But the allure of a good story is too much to resist. When Vice followed up on the story and headed to Bulgaria, they found conflicting reports. Ivanov was ready to tell them about his crazy adventures, including the story of how he nearly sold the nuke to the world's most notorious terrorist. But what he was more cagey about was showing them the actual nuclear weapon, especially with the cameras turned on. After all, televised proof of holding an illegal nuclear weapon for sale would instantly make him the most wanted man in the world. This raises the question, is it actually possible to buy a nuclear weapon? For anyone to do it in person would be tricky, for a lot of reasons. For one thing, nuclear weapons are big. Even a portable one will be fairly heavy and hard to transport through any sort of security. It's likely not to set off metal detectors but give off a radiation signature that would trigger an alert at any airport or other secure facility. And unlike other weapons, there is really no excuse someone can give that would let them slip it past security. The odds of getting it from one location to another without being arrested and jailed are slim to none. The cost of such a weapon would also likely be high, and the bank transaction would raise law enforcement alerts as well. This is why anyone who wants to unload one might be tempted to go another route. The anonymity of the dark web is its main selling point. 
All websites are cloaked in onion routing which makes them hard to track. Anyone logging in likely has their IP addresses hidden, and all communications are done through private networks and with complete anonymity. If money is going to change hands, it'll be done via cryptocurrency, which is bought off the dark web and allows people to exchange goods and services without there being any link to actual money involved. The seller gets the cryptocurrency, cashes it out, and the only visible transaction is between the person and the crypto site. But there's one other big problem with buying from the dark web. If you order something from Amazon and don't get what you asked for, you're heading straight to their customer service chat. But if you order something from the dark web and you get an empty box, good luck. The odds are your scammer has already deleted their account. And if you go to the police to complain, the odds are their response is going to be, what's a dark web? And while this might be an inconvenience for someone who loses several hundred dollars on a mystery box or bootleg, it's possible to lose much bigger sums on the dark web when buying illegal weapons. So while it's possible to buy a nuclear weapon on the dark web, it might be unlikely. For one thing, anyone looking to ship the weapon to its new owner would still face the same problem as any other seller. How do you get it from one place to another? It still has to go through customs, with dogs who would sniff out the radiation in a few seconds. Good boys. And while the dark web is mostly anonymous, law enforcement is on the trail of smugglers who sell dangerous things like drugs and weapons. The head of the notorious black market Silk Road was even sentenced to life in prison for dark web activities. So you might be able to buy a nuke on the dark web, but don't bet on actually getting it. You're far more likely to wind up with a visit from law enforcement or maybe just an empty box and a big hole in your bank account where that cryptocurrency used to be. It's probably best to put those dreams on hold and use the dark web for what it was intended for, buying that pet red panda you always wanted. This video is sponsored by ESET Internet Security, the ideal solution for modern users who are concerned about their privacy. Somewhere in the woods outside of Traben Trabach in Germany is a Cold War bunker hidden from public sight. It's over five stories deep, with concrete walls nearly three feet wide. The bunker was meant to withstand a nuclear attack on the eve of a full-scale war against the Soviet Union and allow NATO to continue frontline operations against the Red Army. It became the hub of a vast criminal dark web empire, which would become home to what was called the Amazon of criminality. 250,000 crimes. That's the official tally by police for the number of crimes that the group running a massive underground cyber bunker operation were either responsible for or aided in perpetrating. At the trial, the eight defendants had to stand for two hours just for the judge to read through all of their charges. The four Dutch, three German, and one Bulgarian cyber criminals were charged with aiding and abetting criminals in crimes involving drugs, contract killings, money laundering, and more. The group got its start when in 2013 the group's leader Johan, last name withheld, bought the former NATO complex from the German government. Originally meant to house a NATO command center, the bunker was built deep underground in order to withstand frontline nuclear weapons employed by the Soviet Union in case of a full-scale war. This bunker and a series of others would have allowed NATO to maintain command and control in a nuclear battlefield. The local townsfolk were wary of the new owners of the bunker, and the mayor contacted Johan asking if he'd be allowed to visit. Johan was extremely open and offered to give the mayor free access as he wished. He only needed a little bit of warning because of, quote, guard dogs. The mayor took him up on the offer and visited the bunker on several occasions, even being allowed access to any locked door he wished. What he found was a slowly growing data center full of computer equipment and absolutely no sign of the millions of dollars of criminal activity that that data center was facilitating. Johan had promised that he would build just such a data center, eventually offering up 80 jobs to the local community. He even promised he'd build an IT training center for free for the town, but even after being questioned, he always remained vague about what exactly his operation was about. Whose data was being processed by the growing rows of computer banks? Where did it all come from? What sort of business was Johan supporting? As the years went by, not only did the local townsfolk not get an answer, but Johan's promises about jobs and a training center failed to materialize. The townsfolk then began to stir up rumors that Johan was actually either buying or producing drugs or selling weapons from the bunker. However, the mayor's visit showed no signs of any such activity. Resigning themselves to the strange, new business startup in their vicinity, the local townsfolk quickly put it out of their minds. They had no way of knowing that an entire planet's worth of crime was being directly supported from their sleepy little town. Everything from massive drug sales and purchases to hit jobs and corporate extortion. It wouldn't be until September 2019 that the residents of Traben Trabach would realize that a monster had been lurking in their midst, as they awoke to the sound of dozens of police sirens and helicopters buzzing overhead. 
But just what had been going on at what was now termed the Cyber Bunker? Was it a secret hacker's den? Were an army of bots lurking inside on its surface ready to prowl the internet, invading networks and stealing information? Or something even worse? No matter what nefarious cyber deeds were happening inside, one thing is for certain. You absolutely have to be proactive in protecting yourself from all types of malware threats. And the very best way to do that is with internet security from ESET, the name trusted by over 110 million users worldwide. ESET Internet Security provides much more than just their legendary antivirus and anti-spyware, it's advanced protection against all kinds of threats. Prevent unauthorized access to your webcam and Wi-Fi networks? Check. How about providing a secure browser that protects you when accessing online banks and crypto wallets? They got that too. Ransomware and phishing attempts? Protect against those as well. ESET Internet Security is truly your one-stop shop for staying safe online. Doesn't matter if you run Windows, Mac OS, or Android, ESET Internet Security provides comprehensive protection for your home devices so you can rest easy, even if the bad actor trying to invade your system is operating out of a Cold War bunker. Right now, ESET is offering viewers of the Infographics Show an extended 90-day free trial, but there's something even better too. The first 500 users to sign up with our special code also get 50% off. So don't wait, go to the link in the description and sign up now to make sure you remain protected with ESET Internet Security. But back to what was really happening inside the cyber bunker. The massive underground server farm had actually served as a bulletproof hosting service, in and of itself not illegal. Bulletproof hosting is a service that allows a customer to host almost whatever kind of material that they want on the host servers, a natural attraction for those seeking to use the internet for illegitimate reasons. In the case of Cyberbunker, the rules were simple. You could host anything you wanted as long as it didn't involve terrorism. This proved extremely attractive for criminal connoisseurs working off the dark web. In theory, anyone could subscribe to a bulletproof host. But the fact that these servers are typically located overseas from a customer and don't worry themselves with terms of use or reports of abuse naturally attracts those who wish to keep their online activity as secret as possible. Usually, cybercriminals and spammers are drawn to these types of online hosts, as they know that the host will not be concerned with abuse reports and has no code of conduct or similar limitation on what an individual may or may not use the server for. These hosting services typically go so far as to even resist court orders entirely only relenting when police physically raid their location to enforce compliance. By then, it's likely that much of a customer's data will have been purged, granting additional protection to the subscriber. That's why, in the case of Cyberbunker, police had to act swiftly and without alerting Johan or his team. Rather than compromising their client's privacy, though, most of these hosts run until they physically shut down to avoid authorities, popping up again later in a different location. Most of these hosts operate out of China, where the government oversight of this sort of thing is relaxed. In fact, the Chinese government engages in so much cyber spying that it's believed to actually cooperate with a segment of cyber criminal elements in its own borders, and countries wishing to investigate bulletproof hosts inside of China's borders have their requests largely ignored. However, Southeast Asia, Russia, and surrounding countries are also popular choices for bulletproof hosts, though Mikolo, which was responsible for an astonishing two-thirds of the world's spam when it was shut down, was hosted right here in the US. The one weakness of a bulletproof host is that they're still under the thumb of upstream providers, which link them to the internet. Thus, if a server is believed to be bulletproof, pressure can be put on the upstream provider to shut the server down. Cyberbunker was set up to allow its users to host websites on the dark web and claimed that it didn't know what activity was taking place on its servers. Its customer's business was its own. Linking a host with the criminal activity that may or may not be taking place on its servers can be difficult, and police have to carefully show that the team behind Cyberbunker knew exactly what was going on. Regular servers can also be used to conduct illegal activity, and often this happens right under the legitimate host's nose, but Cyberbunker was specifically kitted out to cater to cybercriminals, despite what their defense attorney may say. Cyberbunker's bust led to immediate success for police, with the bust directly leading to the shutdown of what came to be known as the eBay for criminals and the arrest of its owner. Dark Market, as it was known, basically allowed a customer to shop for anything illegal that they could wish for, with all the ease and convenience of a legitimate marketplace such as Amazon. Sellers could then provide everything from drugs to counterfeit money, stolen or forged credit cards, anonymous SIM cards, and all sorts of malware. Transactions would take place with Bitcoin helping to mask the identity of the seller and buyer, and goods could be delivered in a variety of fashions. Digital items could be directly downloaded after a transaction cleared 
while physical goods would simply be mailed wherever the buyer wanted. Some street hustlers actually began to get their supply off dark market rather than deal with traditional and dangerous street gangs. The site allowed sellers the convenience of a one-stop shopping experience, free of any possibility for violence, and with goods shipped directly to wherever the buyer wanted. Typically, in order to further mask their operation, a street pusher would buy their drugs online, have them shipped to an Airbnb location, and then have an unwitting third party deliver them to a drop-off point, typically by asking them to do a favor in exchange for cheaper rent, etc. Sellers on dark market would also be rated by customers and have the number of transactions publicly listed, no different than a normal online marketplace. This helped to ensure that the sellers didn't rip off the buyers and establish their credibility. Given the dangerous nature of buying and selling drugs or other illegal items on the streets, both vendors and buyers greatly preferred using dark market or other dark web marketplaces, and the anonymity of Bitcoin made tracing their transactions extremely difficult. In all, over 320,000 transactions occurred on dark market, worth a total of 4,650 Bitcoin or 221 million. As soon as Cyberbunker was busted by authorities, dark market migrated its operation to new servers in Ukraine and Moldova but authorities were able to shut those down as well. Inevitably, the man behind Dark Market was caught, an Australian man known as Julian K. The extent of criminality involved at the Cyberbunker facility is so vast that a full year on, many details are still unknown by the public. What is known is that Cyberbunker had been in operation long before the NATO bunker in Germany. In fact, before expanding to Germany, Cyberbunker operated servers out of a NATO bunker in South Holland, and had a history of criminality well before the public bust in 2019. It was eventually identified as the web host for the infamous The Pirate Bay, one of the most notorious websites for sharing everything from movies to music to books. If it can be digitized, The Pirate Bay hosted it and made it available for download for free, costing the software, movie, music, and other segments of the entertainment industry untold millions in losses. The website has been shut down multiple times but always reappears, and today it is still the premier destination for torrents of all sorts, along with a heaping helping of viruses that come along with them. In 2010, a court ruled that Cyberbunker was no longer allowed to host the Pirate Bay or face stiff fines and up to two years imprisonment for each infringement of the court order. The next year, Spam House, a project aimed at detecting, identifying, and shutting down distributors of spam, identified Cyberbunker as the host for many spammers. They contacted their upstream provider, A2B, and asked them to cancel their service to Cyberbunker, but A2B refused, choosing instead to block only a single IP address related to spamming hosted by Cyberbunker. Spam House then blacklisted A2B, informing them that as long as they hosted Cyberbunker, they would remain blacklisted, forcing A2B to eventually drop Cyberbunker as a client. In 2013, Spam House blacklisted Cyberbunker, resulting in an almost immediate distributed denial of service attack against Spam House. This attack became one of the largest in cybercrime history and dragged in five different national cyber police forces into its investigation. The attack lasted for over a week, but with the help of Google, Spam House was able to weather the attack. Eventually, the attack was tracked down to a criminal gang from Eastern Europe and Russia, believed to be operating in conjunction with Cyberbunker. Though the attack could never be linked directly to Cyberbunker itself, giving them plausible deniability. Shortly after the attack, though, Cyberbunker was believed to itself be attacked, knocking the host offline for a full day and costing them significant revenue. On April 25, 2013, Sven Olaf Kampias, a spokesperson for Cyberbunker, was arrested by Spanish authorities outside of Barcelona. An anonymous press release released on pastebin.com warned that if Campias was not released, there would be more large-scale cyber attacks for every day he remained in custody. Campias remained in custody for 55 days before being extradited to the Netherlands, where he was found guilty and sentenced to 240 days in prison. His sentence, however, was suspended and he was given credit for the 55 already served in Spain. It may have taken over a decade, but authorities eventually nailed Cyberbunker to the wall, so to speak, and shut down the entire operation. The criminal trial is still ongoing, but at least one defendant has been set free after a partial confession and serving 22 months in pre-trial detention. The rest of the defendants will have to face their day in court, and despite claims of ignorance on their behalf, authorities have enough evidence to link them to the incredible amount of crime facilitated by their two bunkers in the European countryside. For the criminals who use cyberbunker services, while there have already been some arrests, others are believed to be pending. Given the intelligence goldmine that Cyberbunker's seizure by authorities has been, it's believed the ongoing investigations and stings will evolve over the coming years. How many criminals will come to trial, however, remains unknown, and for now, illegal activities on the dark web have simply shifted to fresh servers located elsewhere. Now check out why you should never access the dark web, or click this other video instead.